Okay, good morning and welcome to the City Council's third day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined today by the Committee on Criminal Justice, chaired by Councilmember Keith Powers. Let me introduce my colleagues, Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, Councilmember Carlina Rivera, uh, Councilmember Bob Holden, and I know other council members will be joining us throughout the hearing. Today we will hear from the Department of Correction, Health, uh, from the Department of Correction, Health and Hospitals, and the Department of Environmental Protection. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting, to for putting today's hearing together, including the Director Latanya McKinney, Committee Councils Rebecca Chasen and Noah Brick, Deputy Directors Regina Poreda Ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Heads Isha Wright and Curlian Francisco, Financial Analyst Peter Butler, Lauren Hunt, and John Seltzer, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit. A Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, uh, Latina Brown, and Courtney Summarize, who pull everything together. Thank you for all your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of the budget hearings on May 23rd, beginning at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget hearing starts with the Department of Correction. I'm going to briefly flag several areas of real concern. First, the Council is troubled by the level of violence in the city's jails. We're worried about the rates of inmate on inmate violence as well as uses of force on inmates by uniformed staff. I brought this up with OMB at our preliminary budget hearing and again at our executive budget hearing as a question about budgetary impact, lawsuits against the city, medical cost, and overtime, etc. But the truth is this is also an important civil rights issue. While I'm hopeful that closing Rikers and replacing it with borough-based jails may eventually help to reduce the levels of violence, I need to hear more about what DOC is doing to alleviate the crisis now. Second, the Council is troubled by the Department of Corrections' lack of transparency, which impedes vital oversight by the Board of Correction and by the Council as well. Specifically, data requests are often returned incomplete. It's problematic that OMB had such difficulty answering my questions about the levels of violence because there are overlapping reporting systems as well as inaccurate databases because information from paper incident logs are not always typed up and included. The Department of Investigation, the Board of Correction, and the Federal Monitor have each recently commented on systemic data collection and reporting challenges. We're hopeful that DOC's ongoing RFP process to solicit a new inmate management software system will include data gathering and reporting functions that can help to inform effective oversight. Given that the plans for the new system have been in the works for years and repeatedly delayed, I hope to hear, I hope to hear today that progress is imminent. Third is the department's lack of capital transparency. I am, of course, speaking about the fact that the entire borough-based jails program, $3.6 billion in the 2019 to 2023 capital commitment plan, is on a single budget line with zero attempt to break down the cost by borough or into design and construction phases. We spoke with the Department of Design and Construction earlier this week about their efforts to staff up in fiscal 2020 to guide the process, but they couldn't tell us much about how the billions of dollars will be spent. This fiscal 2020 budget may be our best opportunity to impose some reasonable level of transparency on the project. After all, when Council requests additional budget lines and units of appropriation for projects and expenses that are already underway, OMB often argues that doing so risks disrupting the flow of funds. Let's seize the opportunity before it's too late. Now, before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member. And if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I will now turn the mic over to my co-chair, council member Keith Powers, for his statement, and then we will hear from Cynthia Brand, commissioner of DOC. 
Thank you, Chair Drum, and good morning, everybody. My name is Keith Powers. I'm the chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice. I'm pleased to join here my colleague and chair, Finance Committee Chair Danny Drum, my colleagues for today's fiscal year 2020 executive budget hearing to review the Department of Corrections budget. I want to thank the uh, Commissioner Brand and her staff for being here and our correction officers and staff on Rikers Island and throughout all the facilities for their work that they do. We're looking forward to continuing our conversation about the needs and unfunded priorities in the fiscal year. Um, a lot has happened since the preliminary budget we had back in March. The fiscal 29 to 2020 state executive budget included bail reform legislation to ensure that New Yorkers aren't held in jail solely because they cannot afford bail, and we'll certainly want to know the impact on that here in New York City. We released our fiscal 2020 preliminary budget response with recommendations to right-size the department's pay, uh, holiday pay and food budgets. We call for administrative efficiencies through the OTPS budget, and because the capital budget was insufficiently funded, uh, we called on the administration to add funding to 10-year capital strategy to fully finance the building of new jails to close Rikers Island. Uh, third, the administration announced closing Rikers Island jails could be shut down and replaced with borough facilities by 2026, which is one year earlier than the original projection. And most recently, on May 1st, this committee held an oversight hearing uh, reviewing DOC policies and policies and procedures for transgender uh, individuals within DOC facilities. Uh, there are a number of steps that the administration did not take, uh, by, was proposed by the council in reforming and modernizing the Department of Correction, and we are excited by some of the changes that we did get, but recognize that we have work ahead of us to get to where the council believes we should be in terms of the, uh, the budget related to the Department of Corrections. Um, the department's fiscal 2020 executive budget totals $1.36 billion, a decrease of approximately $42 million from last year. The department's headcount totals 11,851, with 9,854 uniform positions and 1,997 9, civilian positions for fiscal 2020. The dis this decrease is largely driven by the closing of GMDC and the additional housing consolidation that has taken place in its aftermath. The expense budget identifies three main categories for DOC to meet its PEG target, personal services accruals, housing consolidation on Rikers, and savings from the partial hiring freeze. These savings help DOC to exceed its PEG target, uh, saving the city $45.4 million. This cut reflects 3% of the budget, and with the anticipated closure of Rikers Island, we'll have questions about whether the budget should be further reduced now or in the future. DOC's expense budget offered minimal changes to other than OTPS expenditures and did not have any new needs. The department's capital plan does not have any new additions to the plan, but has allocated $3.6 billion to begin construction of the new borough-based jails, which is currently going through the Euler process, with a grand total of $8.75 billion re uh, reflected in the 10-year strategy. Uh, additionally, a notable item is, is the projection to complete the construction by the end of 2026, which I noted earlier was a year before the original proposed plan. Additionally, the plan has pushed back the construction of the training academy by one fiscal year with completion in fiscal 2021. Although we have called for this in our budget response, the department's budget does not have adjustments to their holiday and food, uh, holiday pay and food budgets, nor does it include saving recommendations the council recommended through administrative efficiencies in the OTPS budget. So we will work together, we hope, to arrive at a budget that we all can be proud of. Uh, with that being said, again, I want to thank the Department of Corrections staff and the Commissioner for being here today. I uh, want to make sure we also thank our committee staff, our finance analyst Peter Butler, unit head Isha Wright, committee counsel Alana Sivin, policy analyst Keyshawn and Denny, my staff, legislative director Abigail Bessler, and chief of staff a Emily Walsh. Uh, I think I can know we've also been joined by Councilmember Richards, Councilmember Matteo. I don't know if anybody else I didn't know. Corny Adams and Councilmember Member. Member. And with that being said, I'll hand back to our chair, Danny Drum. Okay, and I'm gonna ask our council to swear the uh, panel in. Um, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do, we do. You may proceed. 
Good morning, Chair Powers, Chair Drum, members of the Committee on Criminal Justice, members on the, of the Committee on Finance, and other distinguished members of the City Council. Joining me today are Chief of Department Hazel Jennings, Chief of Staff Brenda Cook, Acting Deputy Commissioner Patricia Lyons, and Acting Associate Commissioner Joseph Antonelli. I thank you for this additional opportunity to discuss the Department's FY20 budget and further describe my vision for the Department and my goals for the upcoming fiscal year and beyond. The FY2020 Executive Budget reflects ongoing reforms and initiatives that we have been implementing to make our Department a national leader in corrections and establish procedures for long-term success. The reforms and initiatives we are implementing are bold and promising. When I testified before you in March, I outlined meaningful reforms currently underway, and I am pleased to have this opportunity to update you on our progress. As we discussed at the March hearing on the preliminary budget, the Department continues to be an active partner in the closed Rikers discussions. Rikers Island was designed during a different era when jail operations failed to provide meaningful opportunities for rehabilitation or to provide the support many of those in our care need for a successful reentry back into their communities. Today's DOC has different priorities. My goal is for those who are entrusted in our care leave our facilities better equipped for success than when they came in. The updated facilities proposed to the borough-based jail plan will help us do just that. When the mayor took office, there was an average of more than 11,000 people in custody on any given day. Today, the average daily population is below 8,000, and recent reform efforts at the state level have ensured it will continue to decrease. My staff continue to engage with the public on this plan through small community meetings, community board discussions, and now meetings with the community boards and the public to discuss the ULERP process. We are listening to the community's concerns, and I'm confident the final plan will reflect that engagement. Last week, the department successfully implemented free domestic phone calls for everyone in our custody. This applies to everyone, regardless of housing unit, housing type, or infraction history. Access to free calls is not based on good behavior, and we have nothing in place that would eliminate an individual's access to free calls. In fact, through this initiative, we actually increased the number and duration of phone calls that our sentenced population previously had access to. Further, in order to accommodate an expected increase in calls, the department is installing over 40 new phones in high density units across our facilities. Free phone calls are a significant shift that represents this department and this city's commitment to humane treatment of incarcerated people and to limiting the financial burden placed on those involved in the criminal justice system. Free phone calls will also enhance an individual's connection with their families and their communities. Finally, it's worth noting that this important reform was enacted ahead of the date required by law. I hope this serves as further proof of the Department's ongoing commitment to culture change and reform. In April, the Department opened a much needed and deserved Staff Wellness Center on Rikers Island. The Wellness Center, housed in the newly renovated space within the George Mochin Detention Center, is open 24 hours a day, Monday through Friday, with additional hours on the weekend. The Wellness Center provides staff with calming environment to engage in fitness, other activities, religious practice, mindfulness, and meditation, or to simply enjoy a conversation with their colleagues in a stress-free environment. The purpose of the center is to provide staff resources in a dedicated location where they're able to relax and engage in healthy activities. Many staff choose to use the center before their tours to ensure that they are entering the facilities mindfully. But staff also use the center to decompress following their tours before heading home. We are very happy with the staff participation in the Wellness Center activities, and we have received very positive feedback. In addition to the Wellness Center, GMDC is also now home to the Learning Center, which provides dedicated space for on-island classroom training as well as a computer lab for online courses. The men and women of the Department of Corrections serve an essential role in the criminal justice system, and their daily work is performed in a challenging environment. I am extremely proud that we are able to offer enhanced services to support their important work. 
Safety and security continues to be this department's first priority. And as previously discussed, the department is nearing the end of the process necessary to operationalize the newly installed body scanners. The ionizing body scanners will be used to screen individuals in custody for contraband upon their admission into our facilities and may also be used if officers receive intelligence or otherwise have reason to believe an individual possesses contraband. These scanners will be to detect non-metallic weapons, such as ceramic scalpels, which have become the chief drivers of slashings and stabbings within the facilities. To date, we have installed scanners in AMKC, GRVC, OBCC, and RNDC. Our scanners have passed rigorous testing from our contracted radiation physicist, and as required by law, these documents are being reviewed by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Office of Radiation Health. The department has been working to support culture chain efforts through multi-level leadership development training opportunities. In the last year, we have brought in experts in leadership and critical thinking skills to enhance our mid and senior level staff members' problem solving, communication, and management skills. We have introduced an emerging women's leaders program through our partners at the Moss Group and have developed a non-uniform leadership development program for our mid-level managers. Both programs use, utilize principles of organizational management to assist unit leaders and area heads in developing their management style and growing the capabilities of their staff. Our Chief of Department, Hazel Jennings, has also taken a critical look at the training available to our assistant deputy, deputy wardens and captains, and she has begun to meet with them bi-weekly in order to support their development and overall operational growth. With regard to the fiscal year 2020 executive budget and its impact on DOC, as you mentioned, the department's fiscal year 2020 expense budget is $1.36 billion. The vast majority of this, 88%, is allocated for personnel services and 12% for other than personnel services. The fiscal year 20 budget is $19 million less than this year's budget of $1.3 billion. This decrease is largely attributed to housing consolidation savings that will take effect at the beginning of fiscal year 20. Included in the preliminary budget are decreases of $46.2 million in fiscal year 20, $21.4 million in fiscal year 21, and $20.7 million in fiscal year 22 in the out years. The following is the Department of Corrections program to eliminate the gap or the PEG proposals included in the executive budget totaling the fiscal year 20 target of 42.1 million. Personal services accrual. Savings of 25.3 million in fiscal year 20 due to the high level of correction officers hired within the past five years who have not yet achieved top salary level. Additional housing area consolidations with a savings of 16.8 million and 209 uniform positions will be achieved in fiscal year 20 in the out years through housing consolidations that have been made possible by the continued decline in the size of our population. The headcount savings will be achieved by reducing the size of the upcoming Correction Officer Academy class, which is scheduled to begin in early fiscal year 20. The following initiatives were also included in the executive budget as part of the citywide savings program. A hiring freeze, which resulted in a reduction of 3.3 million and 46 civilian positions in fiscal year 20 and the out years. The fleet executive order reduction of 1.7 million in fiscal year 20, 910,000 in fiscal year 21, and approximately 190,000 in fiscal year 20 and in the out years for compliance with the Mayoral Executive Order 41, titled Citywide Fleet Sustainability, Right-Sizing, and Efficiency through the New York City Clean Fleet Plan. Savings will be achieved through reducing underutilized vehicles identified by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, reducing the number of vehicles used solely for commuting and through right-sizing of vehicle types. The Skilled Trades Overtime Reduction of 1.3 million in fiscal year 20 and 2.5 million in fiscal year 21 and the out years. Savings will be achieved by filling budgeted but vacant positions that have been difficult to hire and retain in the past. 
the Office of Management and Budget and the Office of Labor Relations are assisting us in this implementation of the initiative. Capital funding. With regard to capital funding, the fiscal year 20 executive capital budget and commitment plan totals 10.1 billion, which covers fiscal years 2019 through 2029. In this plan, an additional 7.7 .7 billion was added to the department's capital budget for the borough-based jail plan, bringing the total funding for the project to 8.7 billion, distributed between fiscal years 20 and 26. This funding shows the administration's commitment to the plan and we are excited to continue moving forward through the planning process and the construction of four new state-of-the-art facilities that will vastly improve the living conditions for those who are in our custody as well as the working conditions for our staff. Headcount. Fiscal year 2019 continues to be the first year we will be fully staffed in our jails for the entire fiscal year since our reform agenda began in 2015, which has led to sustained overtime reductions and more efficient use of our resources. Since May 2014, the department has hired over 6,500 new correction officers, including the most recent class of approximately 400 recruits who entered the academy in February 2009 and are scheduled to graduate in July. With the graduation of this class, we expect our progress to carry forward into fiscal year 20 and beyond. Over the past few years, we have been able to reduce uniform overtime spending from 240.4 million in fiscal year 17 to 198.1 million in fiscal year 18. Through March 31st, fiscal year 2019 uniform overtime spending has totaled 115.6 million, which is down 24% from 152.6 million for the same period last year in fiscal year 18. Now that we have caught up with our hiring and project full staffing in our facilities going forward, we expect uniform overtime to level off and be within the allocated budget in fiscal year 20 in the out years. Though we are slightly above our target at this point in the fiscal year, we are continuing to scrutinize the expenditure of overtime and will take the necessary steps to see that the department is win within the overtime budget. The following is a summary of the changes to the department's civilian and uniform authorized staffing levels included in the executive plan. The civilian authorized full-time headcount is 2,151 in fiscal year 19 and 1,997 in fiscal year 20 in the out years. The authorized headcount decrease from fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20 is mainly due to a savings initiative taken in fiscal year 20, November plan that will not begin until fiscal year 20. The uniform authorized headcount is 10,226 in fiscal year 19, 9,854 in fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21, and 9,695 in fiscal, fiscal year 2022 20, in the out years. The authorized uniform headcount decreases from fiscal year 19 to 20 due to the additional headcount reductions from the closure of GMDC included as part of the preliminary budget, as well as the additional housing area consolidations included as part of the executive budget, both of which take effect in fiscal year 20. The decrease in headcount between fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22 is due to the expiration of staffing funded for the Horizon Detention Facility, which takes effect in fiscal year 2022. The average uniform headcount is estimated to be 10,529 in fiscal year 19, which represents a decrease of 183 compared to an average of 10,712 in fiscal year 2018. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and for your continued support. I thank the mayor and the council for their dedication to criminal justice reform and their ongoing support of the reform efforts taking place at the Department of Correction. I look forward to working with all of you in the years to come, and my colleagues and I are now available and ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I appreciate your testimony. Um, let me just start off with some questions on jail violence, as I mentioned in my opening. At the preliminary budget hearing, I requested that OMB provide an estimate of how much violence in jails has cost the city between lawsuits, medical costs, overtime, et cetera. 
In OMB's response, the director noted that violence is not getting worse. Additionally, OMB noted that the administration has allocated over $200 million to reduce violence. Since then, two reports have been disclosed contesting that assertion. So on March 4th, 2019, DOI sent Commissioner Bran, you, a memo alleging that the Department of Correction underreported the number of inmate fights by more than 1,000 over a three-month period in 2018. On April 18, 2019, the Southern District of New York Federal Monitor published his seventh report on the Department of Correction and concluded that while use of force rates have dropped in select jails, the overall use of force is 79 percent higher in 2018 compared to when monitoring began in 2016. First, how do you explain the underreporting of a thousand um, incidents, um, especially behind what the OMB director told this, this uh, committee? So thank you for that question. Um, before I, I let the Chief of Staff give you the statistics that you're looking for, I'd like to say that you can't, um, there, there's no way to figure the cost that's been invested into the Department of Corrections versus incidents of violence and outcomes in a simple math formula. You have to understand that in, in 2015 when we began our reforms, DOC had not been a priority in this city. We were understaffed, we were undertrained, we had no financial resources, there were no programs for inmates, and our buildings were in state of decay. Uh, in 2014, when this administration came on, that changed. We voluntarily settled the Nunez Consent Decree. We started hiring uh, staff uh, at a, a rate unheard of in this city, and we are finally, as you heard, fully staffed. We've hired over 6,500 new officers. We've implemented programs and services across the agencies for our inmate population. We've increased our mental health services and specialized housing areas. We have been spending money on increasing the facilities to a state of good repair. We've introduced technology into the department. We have uh, focused on staff training and leadership development. And we've installed over 14,000 cameras that um, enhances safety for everyone and ensures accurate reporting. So I understand that the, the comptroller had made a calculation on uh, violence is getting worse and, and uh, population is going down and therefore the cost is increasing and we're not getting a bang for our buck, but I don't think it's a, a simple math formula taking all of those things into account. And I'll let uh, Chief of Staff Cook talk to the particular statistics that you're looking for. Just before you go there, uh, let me ask you, um, it doesn't seem to me to be too difficult to understand or to see um, the correlation between a drop in violence and a $200 million investment if it was in fact invested the right way. If in fact the money was invested the right way, you would probably see a drop in the number of incidents. Yet, you didn't fully answer my question in terms of uh, the underreporting of a thousand uh, incidents as uh, stated by the Department of Investigation. I'll, I'm happy to answer those. Um, with respect to our response to that issue, I, I will provide you with our, our formal response to DOI following this hearing, which has been made public. Uh, that issue of a, a thousand is a distinction that uh, in the manner in which uh, the systems they're captured. The department has a f electronic fight tracking database which captures all fights. Um, the thousand that DOI is referring to in that report are a thousand fights that are in the fight tracking database but aren't represented in our incident reporting system or IRS. IRS is a different system which captures a different category of incidents and in there, when the reason for force was an inmate fight, there's a number of fights that are also captured as a reason for a use of force in that incident reporting IRS database. So it's not that we didn't, and the department's response make this, makes this clear, it's not that we did not capture 1,000 fights during that period, it's that DOI was questioning the presence of a uh, certain number of fights in one database versus the entire fight database, which is the full deck fight count. But your re representation of the number of fights did not 
include the 1,000 that the controller no. said that you now admit when we, were in there. When we report out on fights in our, um, in our public reporting and in the monitor's report, those report those, that data comes from that fight striking database, and that's the department's official count of all fights. And DOI, mis I believe, misunderstood that. So With you can test the DOI? We, res we responded and, and clarified for DOI that there were not any. Um, Has DOI responded fight. back to you? No. With respect to the um, the issue, the second issue raised of uh, the use of force in the well, I'm going to talk with DOI because um, this miscommunication is troubling to me. Very troubling. With respect to the use of force um, and um, the monitor's report indicating that use of force has uh, increased, um, I. We agree with you that use of force and that uh, representation by the monitor reflects the increase in force, but we disagree um, with you, sir, that use of force represents violence. Use of force is a broad category of staff action that's not necessarily violent. Um, force in, by staff in a correctional setting is at times necessary to both maintain safety and the mere fact that uh, force was used does not mean that staff acted inappropriately. A well-executed and well-timed use of force uh, proportional to a threat actually protects both staff and inmates from harm. Um, we've done analysis um, of our use of force, and consistently approximately 15 percent of our force is directed to save individuals who are suffering harm or injury at the hands of another uh, person in custody. And so, in fact, um, our violence measures, our violence statistics, which would be stabbings and slashings, um, uh, serious assaults um, on staff or inmates causing serious injury and fights have actually been decreasing calendar year over year, calendar year as reflected uh, also in the monitor's report and our most recent PMMR. Can you, uh, have you um, written an official response to the DOI? Yes, and I'll provide that to you following this hearing. That's what I mentioned, yes. Okay. Um, the council's preliminary budget response called for savings to be derived through the holiday pay and food budgets at DOC. Additionally, Council suggested savings could be found through administrative efficiencies in DOC's OTPS budget. Can you explain why none of these recommendations were reflected in the executive budget and why the other savings were chosen instead? Sure. So as it relates to the food budget, um, yes, we do. Uh, our food costs have gone down over the past few years, given that we, uh, we have a lower population. Uh, one issue that we do have with the food budget is that some of our food budget is actually, actually federal and state revenue in regards to the younger population, the 16 and 17 year olds going to school, and we've stopped receiving that revenue. So there isn't necessarily savings to be achieved there. As far as the holiday pay is concerned, um, Yes, you're correct that there is some underspending there. However, that money is really used to pay for overspending in other areas, so we could certainly realign our personal services budget, but there is no true savings there um, as that money is used for other shortages within the budget. Okay, thank you. Uh, the department has a budgeted uniform headcount of 9,854 in the fiscal 2020 executive budget, but historically actual headcount is consistently over this number. So, for example, in fiscal 2019, the department budgeted for 10,226 uniform positions, but the actual headcount was 10,519, and that is 293 above the budgeted uniform headcount. Uh, what is the department's strategy for reducing the surplus of positions in the budgeted headcount going forward? We are commonly over our budgeted headcount based on the fact that at any given point in time we have a few hundred people who are currently training in the academy. So our budgeted headcount really represents the positions that we need staffing the jails. So given that if we have five, six hundred people in the academy at a time, those people aren't available to work in our jails, which is why our, our active headcount is over our budgeted headcount. So there's an overlap? Yes, yeah, so we have, basically we have people who are on our payroll that aren't working in the jails because they're in the academy for almost six months. Um, meanwhile, I know on the civilian side, uh, it's been hard to recruit um, civilians to come in to work for the DOC. Um, the department budgeted for 2,151 uh, civilian positions, but the actual headcount was only 1,771, 
or 380 below. The executive budget for fiscal 2020 trims the budgeted headcount to only uh, 1,997 civilian positions, but the department will remain below budgeted headcount until it hires more civilians. In general, how do you do the recruiting for civilian staff? Uh, do you have like job events? Uh, what is your advertising strategy? And what is your overall strategy for hiring the civilian workforce? So when we talk about civilian staff in the department, it's actually less of a recruitment issue and more of a retention issue. Our current uh, rolling 12-month attrition rate is over 16%, which is unusually high, especially for civilian positions. So really our focus uh, needs to be more about how do we retain our staff. I mean, as you know, the working inside of a, a jail facility is not necessarily the most desirable position, especially when you're dealing with titles that are citywide titles that are hired off a civil service list where people are, you know, can do the same job for a different agency that may be more pleasant to work for for the same pay. It makes it very difficult for us to retain our staff. So you're asking for uh, the council or for the um, administration to add uh, in contract negotiations for higher pay for those positions? Is that something I'm, you're advocating for? I think that a com we, I just want to say that we don't, competitively, we're the same as other agencies and our, our conditions are not as good as working for other agencies. So I don't want to advocate for anything in specific. I just want to point out that that's, you know, that's what we're dealing with. I would just like to add that we've worked with OLR in, for certain positions with regard to ID and trials positions um, to do just that. And to answer one of your other questions about recruitment, we have targeted recruitment events for certain positions that we have difficulty in, in hiring. We use social media to advertise civilian openings, um, and we use uh, job, job boards, job posting boards as well. Okay. All right, I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair to ask questions, and then uh, we'll have council member questions, but thank you. Thank you. And I just will note on that, on that issue around um, uh, difficulty in hiring and whether it's being more competitive through salary or title or whatever it is, I think we would be supportive of trying to help in that mission of trying to attract and fill positions where you might have a competitive disadvantage versus other agencies. So we'll, we will look forward to talking to you about that in more detail. Um, I just wanted to follow up on, on the chairs. I know we raised this last hearing. Just two questions on the the, the uh, answers, and some of it's just clarification for me around the violence. Um, the first one was just going back to that 1,000 underreporting, the allegation of underreporting. Can, can you just go back and explain the, the, the two systems, what you reported and what they claimed that you, uh, what, it sounds like there's a, two systems in place, and can you just explain sure. that again? Sure, so um, in the fall of 2015, the department operationalized an electronic tracking system. So it's a it's technology. Um, it's a, data, a database that we um, built, and it tracks electronically um, all in uh, inmate on inmate fight data that historically previously had been captured only by hand in logbooks. So the department reports out of its official electronic fight tracking database for purposes of um, information on uh, fight activity within the department. There is in our a, a different system that tracks all sorts of different types of incidents. It's called Incident Reporting System or IRS. In that system, we track, um, you know, uh, uh, we track. There would be uh, serious injuries to inmates. There would be escapes. There would be deaths. There would be use of force. There would be um, other um, incident types or disturbances of, of a variety, a number of categories. For the incident type use of force, which is captured in that database in IRS, where we report out on our use of force numbers. When we capture the data for a use of force in the department, we give a primary reason and a secondary reason if, one's, if one exists as well. The reasons for force can be, as the officer, I used force to stop an inmate fight. So there are uses of force that are in then therefore in IRS, which have the reason for force being inmate fights. And so we capture all fights in a singular database. In addition, we have fights that were resulted in the use of force are a subset of those fights that are also then in IRS. So that's, if that helps. And, and which one is a DOI with getting, which one is getting with, reported? Without having the, the specifics of it right in front of me, I, 
I'm recalling that the difference is that there are there's a difference between the number of fights in the department's fight tracking database, which the department represents as all of our fights, and that subset of fights which are represented in incident reporting. Um, so, the for, D, so the DOI is, and I understand you're, you're doing a recollection here, but the DOI is saying that they're looking at the category of use of force and then, vers and then versus the database that has the, the just for the fighting and saying there's a thousand or so inmate fight discrepancy that's being reported, is that correct? Correct, correct. Okay. Um, on, the, uh, on the use of force stats, can you, can you, I, I, you know, this is often the point of discussion we talk about um, use of force is the definition and the reporting. I just would add, add to it, and I'm happy to I direct you to these pages. The Nunez Monitor's most recent report came out following that a DOI report of investigation that we're talking about on the department's data tracking, and the de monitor um, who oversees, you know, obviously the department um, and violence and, and use of force um, data reviewed in, and always reviews um, the department's data and indicated specifically again in that report, as they have in previous reports, that they identify no issue of the department uh, undercounting or, or failing to capture um, the department's data on, on fights in force. Yeah, I, I understand that. I think that I think that the concern we have is less the non-reporting on the use of force than the, what the increase. And I know that we've had discussions around how, what that means, use of force, definitional and uh, and process changes and reporting. But you, you had noted that there was a 15 percent. I think it was 15 percent as a number you stated that was a that was. Uh, somebody preventing or keep, you know, it could be a fight and somebody having to break it up, re report that. No, it's actually, it's, it's actually um, narrower than that. Okay. That, that number that you're describing, which I would describe colloquially as rescue force, like the number of times that our um, staff are intervening with the use of force in order to, you know, save someone from another is, is larger um, than that percentage. That percentage that I was referring to with respect to how we analyze our force um, after it happens we um, can see pretty consistently around 15% of, of the force used in a particular month where someone, uh, where a person in custody was injured, that the injury was at the hands of another person uh, in custody, so we were intervening with force to save them from, from violence by another, if that okay. makes sense. Um, thank, thanks for that clarification. But what are the, can you just give us the top three categories, um, category and like maybe percent of use of force uh, that are the, the top three categories, if there's if there subcategories under that that are reported, can you give us the top In three? In terms of the reason for force? Yes. Chief, I... Hi, good morning. Good morning. So for us, our top three reasons of use of force would be inmate fights, it would be refusal of a direct order, or resisting escorts. Can you give us how much percentage of the total that those three represent individually? Can we, we get back to yeah. yes, yes, yes. So I don't have the, the percentage of each. Okay, if you can get back to us, just because yes. we've had this conversation, I still will be interested again to see. I think we have in the past, but I just need to see them again. Um, can I, just going into the budget, um, the, um, any, were there new needs that the department requested from OMB but haven't received in the executive budget, and can you tell us which of those are? No new needs were requested in the executive budget. Is there a reason why, no requests? Uh, we're comfortable with the resource level that, that we had at the time of our submission on the executive budget. Okay. Um, I'll note, I think in our hearings, we've identified a number of things that you guys have talked about needing and the council has agreed on. And so it's, you know, we, I guess, would, would be surprised to hear that there was no, 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 no new needs requested. I mean, there are, you know, things that as an agency we need to prioritize, but we do the best we can to manage within our current uh, total resource level. You know, we look at things at an agency-wide level and figure out how to reprogram as necessary. Okay, um, can you, um, the, the, the total peg was about 3% of your entire budget. I think you exceeded by number what you were asked to do. Um, obviously, inmate population is dropping, facilities are closing, housing consolidation, long-term discussion about the Rikers Island and borough-based jails. Do you foresee and, and when your budget shrinking to address those facilities beginning to shut down, and when would that happen, if so? 
I mean, I think we, we react in real time in terms of our housing area consolidations and closings. So as you've seen, you know, the population has declined significantly. We've already closed one, one facility. Now with these housing area consolidations, we've committed to doing more. I think as the population continues to decline, that's what you'll see from us. But do you have a, you know, we have a 2026 is when we're talking, is now the new date for the borough-based jails. Do you see by 2026, let's say, just using that as a date, your budget decreasing to as the population goes down, as new jails open up? What is the expectation in terms of your overall budget as we move into new borough-based jails? I think as the population declines, we do anticipate reductions in our budget going forward just naturally because we'll have less people in our custody um, as far as the new jails are concerned, in order to determine a staffing level for the new jails, you know, we, kinda, we need to have a design to really kind of understand. Um, so I, I don't necessarily have an answer to what the staffing level for those facilities will, will look like. Um, I can only really look at what our, what our current facilities are and how would we reduce that going forward. Okay, and, and on that topic, does the department have estimates for how the state law changes are gonna impact the average daily population? What is the expected reduction based on what were the recent changes? And, and, and by the way, I understand there might be more, but what, so far, bail reform, speedy trials, is, is there a projection of how, what the average, the reduction in average daily population? So with respect to um, the bail reform, and the city is still working through the impacts of, uh, potential impacts of speedy trial and the other potential legislative items like parole reform. But with respect to the bail reform, the uh, identification presently of our uh, population that is pretrial, and so it's just over 5,000 folks in custody um, who are presently pretrial. Um, the number of, uh, the percentage of those who have either misdemeanors or nonviolent felonies that would be um, directly impacted um, and uh, therefore not have come into custody under the uh, bail reform is about 43% of that pretrial population. 43% is uh, pretrial. If we looked at our daily at, at our daily population, you know, today or yesterday or, or generally um, and within the last few weeks, we see 43% of our pretrial population, which is just over 5,000. 43% uh, of those folks would be um, would would have been excluded under the, um, oh, okay. the bail reform. Got it. Thank you for that. Just moving to the new jails. <laughs> um, I think we have a slide we're going to put up. Um, the new, the, the, the capital commitment plan and executive budget has 3.6 million for the new facilities. The 10 year capital strategy has that number at 8.75. These are the, um, the numbers for, the, for the, the new jails, but we didn't have a specifics related to uh, each borough facility and wanted to know the timeline in terms of the lumps of some amounts per fiscal year. And when we'll get when we will be able to see the level, level of detail about specific boroughs, and maybe maybe a subsequent question to that is, do we know which order the boroughs will be prioritized in terms of receiving new facilities? So that's all a work in progress. Um, the program management consultant hired by the Department of Design and Construction just came on board. We had a series of kickoff meetings um, over the past week or so. So a lot of this is still a work in progress in trying to um, refine a lot of what we've learned in the CPSD program and trying to you know, put that into practice. Um, as far as the, the flow of the funding is concerned, I think that this is a new endeavor for the city with the design build process. So these are all really high level program level estimates since I, I know you mentioned about not having a breakout by facility. I, mean, I think right now this estimate is so high level it really just looks at the program as a whole and as we get further along in the work, we'll be able to break out by facility. Okay, I mean, we would, as, when, as, as soon as you have that information available, be interested in seeing the broken down by borough and having more specific detail put to Absolutely. it. And, and on the, the, Queens has been designated as the home for a woman's facility there. Can you just explain how that was this chosen location amongst the four for where to put the woman? Sure. Um, with respect to um, that location, Queens is presently the a location of um, uh, where we uh, take women in our custody uh, to Elmhurst Hospital. And so we were intending to represent, as we do now with one women's facility, um, we have one nursery and um, maternity ward. And so we were always going to represent just um, a singular facilities um, uh, I, you know, com that component in just one of the four bo borough facilities to begin with, which had already been cited, selected as Queens. So then, as we heard from um, justice-involved persons and advocates and, um, you know, m members of, uh, you know, the elected officials and, and commu the community, 
about decentralizing women and that they um, strongly, strongly requested that we put what would, is projected before the bail reform to be only approximately 200 people in custody at the time these new jails would open to take this less than, now less than 200 women and put them together at one facility for maximization of um, services and have their own uh, visitation space and uh, intake and admissions process. Um, the um, city determined that uh, we would do that and we would put um, that small number of women all together at the Queen's facility, which would already have the nursery and the maternity ward. Uh, thanks. And I also just was remiss to mention that we were put joined by Councilor Cohen, Moya, and Amprey Samuel. Um, just a few more questions. I want to hand it over to, to colleagues as well. Um, oh, uh, just another follow-up question on the on the Queens. Um, I think there was discussion why the DA's office would be located in that facility. Can you give us an? Uh, that's what we had heard. Is that is there any plans to have the Queens DA's office housed inside the new facility? That's. That's, that would be news uh, to me, and it's not um, something that I'm aware has been discussed. Okay, thanks. Um, just on, on this, we, we, you know, the other item we've been asking for is, and this is across the board with every agency for what it's worth, I think it's 127 or 120 something units of appropriation to give us a better understanding of how spending's broken out. Um, we had been asked, we've been asking, and I think I asked this last year as well, to, to give us, um, as the new borough-based facilities open up, to give us individual units of appropriation for each jail by borough. Can the department commit to that? So, I mean, we're committed to working with the council on trying to provide the transparency level that you're looking for. I think the real challenge that we're facing right now is through the design-build process. We're, we're really in a learning stage on how to implement this. And as, um, you know, the RFQs and the RFPs go out and the structure of the program is put together, that's kind of how we'll figure out how the contracting has to work and how the technical aspects work in terms of breaking it out into multiple units of appropriation. But do you think when they open up, you can provide it to us once, once you have new jail facilities or even once you get past ULERP and past design, whether we can have these broken out? Because I, I understand it today, it's basically one unit of appropriation. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. giant. You right, know, new new really, jail facilities. Yeah, I mean, so if we're going to open new jail facilities, de you know, decentralize, you know, Rikers Island, it, 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 it seems like it would make sense to give us you know, clarity on spending in each of the different facilities. And I'm, I'm curious whether you guys can commit to doing that. I think as we move forward in the process and we figure out technically how this is going to work, we're, we're open to that and just can't commit to it because. When do you guys think you can make a commitment around, or a commitment or no commitment around, when you can have a final, a, a reasonable final answer on units of appropriation? I mean, I think as we go through the RFQ and the RFP stage and we really fully understand what we're looking at in terms of, you know, how many contractors are going to be working on this job and, and that type of thing, that's when we really have a What's the timeline for that? Um, I don't have a timeline for you right now on that. Okay. I, I, it, it's within um, uh, the next year. The state legislation on design build um, has a, a deadline in it for the city to issue um, RFQs and RFPs by uh, April 1st of 2020, and so it, that 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 certainly is a deadline within which we're working in order to maximize our ability to use design build. Okay, so we were gonna we are gonna ask, and this is on other agencies as well, but certainly here for better transparency on the the chart we had up around spending and how that's being a better, a better clearer breakdown for the spending and the money and sort of how that's being allocated and the units of appropriation for the different jails to be per jail facility. And we'll, you can expect we're going to ask that question again in the future and continue to push on that. And we'd ask for you guys to take that seriously. Since, and, and the units appropriation all across the board, the finance chair can tell you is, a, is something we've been asking for. Uh, just my last round of questions before I hand it off to folks. Um, you noted in your testimony, May 1st, Department, actually I think it was even before May 1st, Department stopped charging inmates for phone calls based on, or we had, we, we had based on legislation passed by the city council, have restructured your contract and now are, uh, have a new program around uh, telephone fall calls. Can you tell us how many, how the calls, how many more, can you give us a daily change in calls since that's been implemented? Oh. Oh. I believe my last time you were with the microphone. There was an additional 60,000 calls since implementation per day. Per day? Per day. 60,000. Yes, and when we averaged out the minutes, um, it would average out minutes. Minutes, minutes. per day, as you say, calls a lot. Minutes, yeah. that's a lot of calls. 
Um, 8,000. 8,000 phone calls, yes. 60,000 minutes. And uh, when we averaged out the total amount of calls and minutes together, it would appear if every inmate used the phone, they would be using the phone four times per day for an average of 10 minutes per call. And, and that, okay, what was the average minutes per call in, under before May 1st? Do you have any data on that? 8,000 more phone calls. I'm wondering if you're getting more longer time spent on the phone. Just curious. We would, we would have to do that analysis. Yeah, sure. So the, the, we looked at really the, the seven days prior and the seven days after implementation. So the increase was order of magnitude from around 170,000 um, minutes per day up to about 225, 230,000 minutes per day being used on phone calls. Okay. And the, the call volume went from about 23,000 calls a day to 31,000 calls a day. And, are, and what are the, you, you had mentioned uh, in your testimony, no restrictions, but can, no, no, or no punishment around um, around uh, phone calls, you know, as a punishment. Can you just tell us what the current rules or restrictions are around placing a phone call under the new post May first plan? So uh, previously, uh, for sentence inmates, they were only allowed two phone calls weekly, and detainees had more. Now, every inmate receives the same amount of phone calls, and we've also increased the amount of time inmates who are in punitive seg can utilize the telephone. They went from one personal phone call six minutes a week to now they're making 15-minute calls daily. Got it. Thanks for that. I'm going to uh, stop there. I think I have another couple questions, but I'll wait to the end. Um, I think we're going to hand it over to colleagues now. I think first up is Councilmember Grudencic with questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you, Chair, Chair Powers. Um, I was going to say good morning, Commissioner, but we've passed that point. So um, the City of New York, uh, we finally have some answers. Uh, I'd asked Director Hartzog at two hearings early this year about the amount of money that we're going to spend on these new jails, and uh, we agree at this point that it's almost $9 billion. Can I ask you who came up with that estimate? Anybody? Sure, sure. That, that estimate is you know, a conjunction between the, uh, the consultant that, that's working on the CPSD program as well as the Department of Design and Construction. And how long has this person been working on this estimate? I mean, a lot of money. It's, double, it's, it's almost double the amount of capital spending we're spending on parks. So I'd like to know exactly how long that we've been working on this estimate. I mean, this estimate's been worked on more or less since the inception of the CPSD program over a year ago. But the, the estimate has changed over time, or the variables that go into the estimate have changed over time, because the size of the facilities have changed over time as well. Director Hartzog had indicated to us that they were hopeful, based on changes in the state law, that the size of the new facilities, the four of them, would be smaller. Do you anticipate them getting any smaller than you have them pegged at now? Well, right now, the, the facilities, we're still trying to figure out how much smaller they will be in terms of square footage and size, um, but we are realizing a reduction now with the population being projected to be 4,000 instead of 5,000. Um, if there are more changes that can reduce the size of our population, absolutely, the facilities will get smaller. So is it in theory possible, because I've been in government a long time and I know that very few things get built on time and on budget, that we could see a lower estimate as we go forward in this process? I, won't, I know you're under oath, but I won't hold you to the, uh, I'll, I'll accept a guess. Well, to answer your, your question, possible, possible is yes. Possible, yes. I like possible. So um, $8.75 billion divided by 4,000 is a lot of money per jail cell. Are these the most expensive jail cells in the world? I wouldn't know that answer. It seems like a lot of money to me. Um, I'm going to do some quick math here. At 4,000, it's 2.2, almost 2.2 million dollars per jail cell. We could build each of these folks a, a house for far less. And I'd like to know if the estimates that you have include design, build, and savings that we could potentially wring out of this. This is an enormous amount of money that the Department of Corrections is being entrusted with, along with DDC. Among the 8.65, it's, it's essentially $1,000 per New Yorker is almost exactly the amount of money. There are 8.65 million New Yorkers at $1,000 a head. That's $8.65 billion. So 
I'd like to know um, if there's any way that we can, we can do value engineering to try to ring these costs down. It seems j the numbers are incredible to me. Yeah, and the, the costs are constantly being reviewed. It isn't that this is, this is it and this is what it's gonna be. Now that the program management consultant has come on board, that's a new set of eyes looking at the estimate, figuring things out, looking for ways for us to be more efficient. I mean, this estimate was based off of the CPSD program, which is really just a, a high level conceptual design to really determine what the maximum size of the facilities could be. I mean, the ULERP is based on the size of a, you know, the ULERP applications on the size of a facility that's already getting smaller. So I feel like, you know, every day we're actively working to try and make these facilities smaller and less expensive. I thank you. Uh, I yield the balance of my time, Chairman. <laughs> Good thing it's negative 40. Uh, I think we're now we have can, uh, questions from Council Member Adams. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, thank you for your testimony today, you and your staff uh, for being here, everyone for being here today, as well as your tremendous support for our co-naming this weekend for our fallen officer, Jonathan Arrain. It was tremendous, and I thank you. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner Gilardi. I see you out there. Uh, fabulous anthem, so we thank you uh, for that. I just have just a couple of questions related to the, uh, the Queen's situation, and we know that uh, there has been significant pushback uh, for the location of the jail in Queens. Um, no matter what side of the fence individuals are on with the, with the position of this particular uh, location, however, how much input from the community board uh, was considered in the decision? The community board process is presently ongoing and the community boards have been um, having a series of uh, engagements, um, hearings, and um, meetings um, to, and the administration, the Department of Correction, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, um, uh, the city's legislative affairs, and, and DDC and others have been participating in those engagements with um, each of the community boards um, that both cover the sites in each borough um, and community boards that are adjacent um, to those sites. And so the engagement has been um, significant and ongoing and we have been, uh, even pri prior to the ULERP community board process, we're engaged with neighborhood advisory um, councils um, from uh, individuals who lived within the, the community boards within the areas of the proposed jail facilities, plus advocacy groups, um, interested um, you know, uh, parties, elected officials, um, and the like. The engagement has been going on um, since the announcement of um, the master plan uh, last summer, and obviously the entire jail-based, um, borough jail-based system is derived based on significant community input um, that led up to the Lipman Commission's report and then former um, uh, Speaker M uh, Mark Viverito and the mayor's um, support as well. Okay, thank you. M my concern is that um, I, w I would just like to, for there to be complete transparency uh, for this decision uh, between the DOC and the community specifically, uh, so that any questions um, that may be left out there in the atmosphere are completely answered with as much honesty and transparency that you can provide our community in Queens. That said, there has been, and we, we talked about it, I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding correctly. Will this facility be a women's facility? Has that decision been finalized? Because I've been told it has not been finalized, whether or not this will indeed be a women's facility. Will it? Um, and uh, if, if we don't know, when will that final decision be made? The, presently, the decision has been made um, as, we've, as we are moving into the planning and the uh, design build, ultimate design build, um, for the women to be um, located at the Queen's uh, facility. Um, whether or not there is, um, uh, you know, a change to that down down the road, um, you know, until these um, facilities are, are built, I suppose, anything is possible, but right now the city um, has heard from uh, the community and has decided that 
rather than uh, to support the decentralization of women in the communities from which they come, that this small population less projected less than 200 women um, will be centralized together to provide them um, the greatest um, uh, support services and um, access um, together as a cohort within the Queen's facility. That decision, yes. Okay, thank you. So as we stand today, the Queen's facility will be a women-only facility. It's, it will be a, it will be a, will not. it will be a facility which houses the entirety of the uh, jail population of women, but the remainder of the facility will, in Queen's, will be a male facility. So it is a facility where the women will all be located, and the population of the remainder of the jail will be male. Okay, understood. Thank you. Council Member Holden. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, to follow up on uh, Councilman Grodencheck's uh, remarks on capital, um, being around the city so long, I, I would say that whatever the budget is for the jails, the, com the uh, community jails, uh, you could probably double it <laughs> uh, when the smoke clears. I, I think uh, it'll, I'm going to go on record to say this is going to cost $5 million per cell, at, uh, jail cell. That's my estimate. And we'll see if I'm right. <laughs> But getting to um, jail design, I want to talk about jail design. Uh, have you looked, I mean, I don't know if, if you guys are involved in this, but what model jail um, around the world is, is, is um, the city of New York using as, as really their, the basis for building these jails? So what, what system exists today that we could actually look at and, and comment on? So. I'll let uh, Associate Commissioner uh, Antonelli respond to it with respect to a jail that we did visit um, along with other city agency folks um, during the, um, as part of the CPSD, but certainly the program management consultant, which um, Associate Commissioner Antonelli said has just come on board within the last um, uh, week or so, they have identified for us, for, for DDC, for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice as a, as a group working on this um, uh, RFQs and then the RFPs for this design build process, a number of facilities that they would like us to see portions of for uh, purposes of just what you're describing, which is to see in practice um, the manner in which, you know, something has been designed, the manner in which an operation is carried out in a modern facility that would bring about um, the efficiencies that the uh, City of New York and the Department of Correction are looking for, the levels of safety, the operations um, and opportunity for programming and function in a, in a high-rise jail specifically. So if you identify a city or a country that's doing it well, you will look at that and and will you and obviously report back to yes. us what you feel is a good model um, uh, for you know a jet, the design of jail cells. Um, does staffing vertical jails as opposed to more horizontal that are on Rikers? Does staffing vertical jails um, require more personnel? just in, in movement up and down? So the, num the total number of, of all of the posts within a facility is, is uh, still you know, to be determined by the design, but there will be specific aspects of modern jail these modern jail designs that will, um, in fact, re uh, remove posts. For example, we operate our facilities with what's known as an A station or a bubble, um, and that's a, a stationary officer that um, has a windowed view um, to housing units, uh, to two housing units, one on generally either side of the bubble. They don't actually, you know, generally enter the uh, floor facility. They don't, um, they aren't engaged in that direct supervision of the individuals in custody. So those, that bubble is a, that is a dynamic that is not uh, present in modern gel, gel design in, at all. And so those posts will no longer be necessary. So we will not construct facilities with a post. Um, we also, because of uh, direct supervision and the lines of sight and the improvement of the design of each individual housing unit, will have, um, uh, better ability to supervise um, the housing unit maximum living uh, unit size, so the num maximum number of folks who could be housed in any particular unit will be smaller than our living units um, by and large right now. So that drives the ratio of, of staff to um, detainees. And so there's a lot of uh, efficiencies, I think, in modern uh, jail design that will drive our staffing numbers, but um, and the movement will, will, will be more limited. There'll be direct access to recreation for each unit on each unit. And so we'll no longer be escorting, um, you know, groups of, of uh, 
uh, folks from every housing unit to the main yard. Um, there'll be more programming space on every unit, um, opportunities for services to be delivered to then those um, persons on the unit. So a lot of our escort um, posts and things would be um, uh, likely reduced and, and made um, rendered um, not necessary. So there's 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 a number of, of efficiencies in, in modern design, but the, the number of posts in each jail will be um, known as we know what the specific design of the jail has been. Okay, this is, uh, this is my first round, so I, I, I would like to have a second round. I'm Thank not you. sure if we'll get into a second round, but I'll put you down on the list. We have now uh, Councilman Randy Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. I don't know where we're at. Um, do you know uh, on a given day how many buses travel from the Rikers to the Hall of Justice or to 161st Street in general? So that depends on how many inmates we have on the court calendar. Do you have an average? How many? I mean, on a, you know, you're going to plan for next week. How many buses are you going to have available for next week? We, we transport approximately 900 to 1,000 individuals a day to the court facilities from Rikers Island. I, we could get back to you with the particular breakdown to um, the Bronx. Can you, oh, to, to courthouses around the city? Correct. Yes. Correct. Do, you know, do you know how many inmates on average you send to 161st Street a day? We'd have, off the top of our heads, we don't have that number, but we can get back to you with that. So you have no idea how many buses you send barreling through the Bronx every day? None. No idea. We will do that analysis and get and get it back to you I, before I the end of the day. It. And the buses you operate are diesel buses? Yes. Yeah. That's correct. All diesel buses rumbling through the Bronx. So even if we ultimately, uh, I know bringing down the population will aid that, but ultimately this model of these uh, corrections uh, buses rumbling through the Bronx, that's not going to end anytime soon under whether we close Rikers or we don't close Rikers currently, right? You, you intend to move uh, defendants from the new location, from the new jailhouse to, to 161st Street by diesel bus still? That would be correct. Okay. Uh, I'd like to know the numbers. I am, uh, I am very curious about that. I'm concerned that in addition to spending, you know, trillions of dollars, uh, that uh, this model is really ultimately going to still negatively impact Bronx Heights. Um, you know, I've observed your fleet. It's not that fresh, uh, and having these, the idea that we're going to build a jail that's going to continue diesel buses running through Bronx County for the next 50 years, I really have a hard time getting my head around. Um, but I, I would appreciate the data on the number of buses. Sure. And the number, I guess also, just as a, since I have a minute, do you know what time the buses, what time you leave Rikers to go to 161st Street? So the buses depart Rikers at various times, depending on um, our first vans for inmates who are on trial versus inmates who are not on trial. So normally, the earliest bus would leave approximately about 6 a.m. 6 a.m. So you, if you have people on trial, you send out buses at 6 a.m.? That's correct. Uh, you know, if I, if I could get, I'd be interested actually in seeing the bus schedule, because I will tell you, it's anecdotal, of course, uh, but I have been in the uh, Hall of Justice, and I've seen a lot of downtime waiting for we're trying to get defendants from Rikers to the courthouse. You know, a lot of people standing around wondering, you know, when they're going to arrive. Um, usually, you know, it's well past 930. Everybody's ready to go, but we have no defendant yet. So I, I am curious as to what the schedule is. That's helpful to know. I, I'm impressed if we really do get buses rolling out at 6 a.m. That, uh, that would be useful information. And, and again, when you get an opportunity, I would appreciate the number of buses. Thank you, Chair. Councilmember Rivera. Hi, good afternoon. Just to try to be brief since I know we're already over time. So the, the security risk group, or what is commonly known as the gang population, I have a statistic, well, I have a percentage in front of me. 67% of this group is involved in jail incidents. So how much does it cost the department to manage the SRG population, and are there any new programs or initiatives that you're undertaking within the facilities themselves uh, to, to try to address the costs associated for the violence that transpires between these individuals? So I don't have a particular breakdown for you, um, and I don't believe uh, we do with respect to dollars spent on um, SRG-related 
uh, folks in custody, but I will let the um, Chief of Department talk about some of our um, uh, initiatives and um, the advancements that we've made in department operations to address that rising um, uh, SRG-involved population. And maybe you could also let us know the CO to inmate ratio for those that are classified as SRG. That'll give us a little bit of an idea of, of, of costs in the budget. That, but that's whatever so, the chief wants to talk about is, is okay. So that's not, how, um, that's not how we house folks. And so um, those that are um, identified as uh, SRG or gang involved in our custody are um, housed throughout the department, um, throughout all housing types, including, you know, um, you know, mental observation or, or um, you know, young adult or, um, uh, you know, protective custody. And so it's, it, it would be, um, we wouldn't be able to tell you that there would be a housing, a housing, a staffing ratio for that population. Uh, we can get you some staffing ratio information just uh, for inmates in custody generally, but that would include um, our SRG population. So uh, she kind of answered my question because one of the things I wanted to say was that uh, inmates who are identified as security risk groups are housed in just about every housing area. Um, we have general populations versus protective custody versus adolescent versus uh, ESH, ESH versus secure. So there is not one specific house in which they are housed in. So the staffing ratio would really vary based upon the uh, criteria or the category of the housing, per se. Well, it's not even the housing that, I, I know that you're not gonna have like the Bloods and the Crips like in separate sections. My, my question to you is, what are you doing to address some of that violence? Some of, is there programming or initiative that you're embarking on when you're, you're in shared spaces, is there additional COs that are there because you know that's when they can, the, the rival gangs can interact? So we're very conscious about the rival gangs. We use our intelligence bureau to, to guide us in that and when, when they have intel about um, possible violence. We may staff up an area where, where folks are gonna be in a common area, for example, rec or law library, uh, but we monitor that very closely. The programs department has brought in credible messengers who are folks who have been previously associated with gangs um, to speak with the individuals who are in that lifestyle right now. We have also put programming on um, iPads, tablets, so that if individuals would like to uh, engage in a lifestyle change, a behavior change, and do not feel comfortable sitting in a group with others to discuss how to do that, they're able to be in their cell and listen to uh, podcasts and other folks talking about how to get out of that lifestyle. And so we, officers speak with individuals in the housing areas about their lifestyle and, and where they wanna go. We have our program counselors who are in the housing units talking about that. So yes, we are doing what we can to modify behavior and get them to want to change their lifestyle. Thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Powers for the time. And a quick special shout out to PS64 who's in the balcony. Okay, we've uh, been joined by Councilmember Eugene and Reynoso and we're going to go back to Chair powers for our final questions. Thank you, and I'll keep it short because I know you guys have a long day ahead. Um, there was a couple of things that we had both mentioned in our uh, response we've asked in the past. One of them is about the training academy. Councilor Holden, I think, it has the has a piece of it. Speaker Johnson has the other piece at John Jay College. I think it, you mentioned the wellness center on Rikers Island as well uh, in terms of, of staff resource. But can, can you tell us another up, an update on where we are in terms of finding a training academy? Um, what, what is the ongoing process? for finding a new site and can you also tell us who, who's leading the, lo lo the location finding for a new training academy? Sure, so the site search is still ongoing unfortunately. Um, for all s site searches around the city, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, they're kind of the, the real estate arm for the city so they're charged with leading that site selection search. And, and what's, you know, we were here a year ago, money's in the budget, um, I, you know, I, I believe, you know, we don't have a modernized facility. We're splitting people up. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a little more detail about what the actual search process is in terms of how or what the DOC's role is in finding a site or identifying one? 
Um, so we give our requirements to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. So we've developed a general program, you know, kind of like what the CPSD program is for the jails in terms of square footages, requirements that we have in there, like we require having uh, an indoor gym, an auditorium, how many classrooms, that type of information, as well as other general requirements, like it needs to be close to public transportation, needs to have parking, that type of stuff, and then that information is taken and sites are looked for. Yeah, so I mean, by the way, the, the police academy is not near public transportation in College Point. I think it's near access points for driving, but not necessarily near public uh, public facilities. I, you know, I, I just want to stress this again. I, I think that I understand DCAS is finding it, but it's a facility for your employees, and they're right, I think, to say, why are we getting treated differently than other departments in this city when, when we all can agree that they have a I mean, a very challenging job, and we are asking them to do, I think, more and ask them to take on more training. Yeah, and, we, and, and Associate Mr. Antonelli is, is uh, correct in that uh, we put out the requirements. We've also, we also participate in the review of potential um, sites. We've, you know, made site, um, uh, site visits. We are in active, uh, coordinated discussion with the um, First Deputy Mayor's Office. It, this uh, training academy is also, a, a, if you've reviewed the Nunez Monitor's reports, is a, of interest, um, you know, and uh, to the Nunez Monitor as well, and um, and so it, it's is it is a it is a priority and it is a process um, that we are continuing to push um, to push through. But um, as um, New York City is a is a is a highly occupied place, and so to try and identify a space that is um, you know sufficient for our program needs and um, uh, you know the other um, uh, city property criteria um, is 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 a slower process than, than maybe we would all like. Okay, I, I, I agree with that. It is, it's working, it's going too slow. Um, the, uh, uh, and we will follow up with that, I can follow up with the Deputy Mayor on that as well. The, um, uh, the last question I have is, um, you know, st officers and staff who work there have talked a lot about having modernized technology to be able to use tablets and smartphones, more personalized equipment to be able to use, so not sharing equipment. Can you tell us, the, we, we had, uh, you know, I had actually uh, myself talked about this in the past, and um, I think it's, you know, something that I'm interested in hearing the department's position on is what about, you know, adding technology to, into the hands of, um, so that we, I mean, A, it seems like we'd be better data tracking for us and for the agency. If we ask for information, you'd have it more readily available if there was you know, more technology in, in, in the hands of the people who are working there. They've asked for things like smartphones and tablets or some sort of device for better communication. Is there any effort to try to um, enhance the technology or, uh, and then sec separately do personalized equipment so that people aren't sharing equipment? So um, we have introduced modern technology uh, at a rate probably slower than everybody would like. Our recruits now in the academy, they don't carry around notebooks with, with paper anymore. Everything that they have for training is on a tablet. For those in our facilities, um, unfortunately, these facilities were never wired for Wi-Fi, and so to walk around with a phone to be able to do some work on a tablet or a phone isn't, um, isn't something that we have the ability to do widespread right now. We have started to develop training on and putting them on tablets so that people can sign out a tablet and do their training while they're in the facility rather than be pulled out and go into a classroom. We are looking at every option available to make our staff have an easier time doing their job through the use of technology. Okay. And every every facility has at, at least one, if not multiple, what we would refer to as a business center, which is an area with um, um, you know desktop computers that are available to uniform staff who you know don't otherwise have a, a work at a desk with a computer to access both um, um, you know as the commissioner mentioned you know uh, training and other materials. We've added electronic uh, post order order folders, which generally historically used to be in paper and that is what it sounds like it describes to you as an officer what the responsibilities of that uh, post are and so those are available now um, on the computers within the stations and then throughout the facility we've added uh, I know that when we testified the commissioner listed for you and then we provided I think as follow-up a list of technological um, developments that the department has um, implemented over this administration and one of them um, for example is the um, inmate wristbands which is a uh, uh, 
tracking system where we are able to electronically, much like when you get a package delivered, it scans a barcode, um, and then it, you, know, you know that um, something has arrived. So we are using a barcode scanning um, technology, and then that can replace um, the tracking of, of manual logbooks and paper. And so there is technology for operations that's being introduced um, throughout the department, um, and that, that is uh, taking away some of that um, manual paper-based system that um, officers' jobs have historically relied on. So, to, yeah, okay. Just to, to finalize that, with response to Councilmember Drum's question in the beginning of the hearing about the jail management system, we expect to have our valent, uh, vendor selected by the end of the year and begin work on that project um, in the second quarter of 2020. Well, and can I just say, and this is my last my question, I'm sorry, I know you have a long day. Um, uh, why end of the year? I mean, that seems like a long timeline for choosing a vendor. It's just been the um, procurement process. It's been a procurement process. Mm -hmm. RFP has been issued, responded to, yes. and now they, that vendor has been selected. The vendor who's been selected and is go, has to go through the, the contracting and procurement process. Is that so correct? This, um, this particular project is going through the DOIT systems integrator. So we're working through DOIT with their contract resources. So I don't, I don't have an answer at that this time if a vendor has been selected, but we've recently submitted a purchase order this past week um, to do it for additional procurement support moving through this process. Okay, and we're gonna have some follow-up questions on the one I had just about cost estimates for certain items and we'll follow up in a letter. Thank you to the chair, thanks. Thank you very much, thank you uh, commissioner, thank you to all the members of the team for coming in today. Um, we're going to end it here now and uh, we'll re um, reconvene in about five minutes with health and hospitals, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Hospitals, chaired by Council Member Carlina Rivera. We've also been joined by Council Member Antonio Reynoso, Council Member Matthew Eugene, Council Member uh, Mark Levine, and I think other Council Members will be joining us shortly. We've just heard from the Commissioner of the Department of Correction, and now we will hear from Dr. Mitchell Katz, President and Chief Executive Officer of Health and Hospitals. In the interest of time, I will keep my remarks brief and limited to a single issue. And this is an issue that's really getting to be annoying. The consistent failure of Health and Hospitals to provide this Council with timely budget information. In fiscal 2017, my predecessor in this role, Jalissa Ferreras Copeland, said at the Health and Hospitals Executive Budget Hearing that the request for financial information was provided to staff less than 24 hours before the hearing. She called this completely unsatisfactory and said in the future, I expect the administration to be forthcoming with the documents and data we need. At last year's preliminary hearing, Dr. Katz, you promised me that you would have up-to-date information well in advance of the executive budget hearing, but this did not happen. We actually even delayed the hearing last year by three weeks to give you more time, and again, we only received the information the day before the hearing. Upon questioning, the OMB director assured me that for fiscal 2020, I am guaranteeing you, quote unquote, that you will have the financial plan ahead of time and you will have sufficient time to review it before your hearing. Yet here we are in fiscal 2020 and it's like a broken record. Every year we complain, every year H&H &H and OMB promises it won't happen again, and the next year we go through the same motions. I suppose we should be grateful that this time we receive the financial information two days before the hearing instead of just one. But this remains an unacceptable and disrespectful manner of doing business. Dr. Katz, I respect you and I respect the work that you're doing to stabilize the city's public hospital system. And I fully expect that this will be the last year that we will have to have this conversation with H&H. &H. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Councilmember Rivera. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Carlina Rivera, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Hospitals. I would like to start by echoing my colleague, the Chair of Finance, uh, around the continued concerns over the delay of providing materials that allow transparency and accountability on the H&H &H financials. We did receive the cash plan for the preliminary budget. That was the first time that H&H &H has completed this agency standard practice well ahead of schedule. Unfortunately, we did not receive the cash plan for the executive budget until this week, leaving our budget staff an impossibly small amount of time to adequately review the plan. I appreciate and admire H&H's optimism for the system's financial future. However, in light of the federal and state attacks and cuts on health care, the importance of effective communication and clear expectations is unquestionable. As a co-equal branch of government, the Council relies on and expects to have adequate time to review all information pertaining to the city's public hospital system. The subsidy that H&H &H receives from the city is projected to be $1 billion for fiscal year 2020, and it is unacceptable that we only have days to review. I am hopeful that during today's hearing, we can receive more precise details on how H&H &H plans to close its budget deficits in the wake of state funding cuts and federal threats, while handling new needs in the rollout of NYC Care. I'd like to one again, once again express my concerns about not including federally qualified health centers in the plan. These clinics are on the ground already working with the populations aimed to be served by NYC Care, and it is not clear how this new program will fit into the existing health care infrastructure in the city. In addition, I feel some trepidation that there is no capital budget in the 10-year strategy to support the rollout and increased services expected of NYC Care nor are there any specifics about how NYC CARE will affect other initiatives that are primarily focused on generating revenue. In addition, with the continued assaults on the rights of transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary TG, 
TGNCNB from the federal government, I was disappointed not to see any baseline funds to support the training of healthcare staff on how to adequately support this population. This comes after the impassioned testimonies we heard at the preliminary budget hearings for the committees on health, mental health, and hospitals. I had hoped that the administration would have sufficiently motivated to baseline $150,000 to improve the experience of TGNCNB people and the experiences they have at h, &H facilities, especially in light of how minuscule $150,000 is in comparison to the full $92.5 billion budget. I look forward to hearing about your plans to continue opening the lines of communication to ensure full transparency and your plans for a sustainable future for H and H budgets. Now, back to Chair Drum. Thank you very much. And with that, we're going to have uh, Council square the panel in, and then hear testimony. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Uh, I'm Mitch Katz. I'm the director of the New York City Health and Hospitals. I want to uh, say I'm deeply sorry about the, the council not getting the information uh, sooner. Uh, there uh, is a disjuncture between the OMB planning of the health and hospitals budget and these hearings, and I want to work to make sure that there is full transparency, and I'm happy to do more briefings, more more uh, hearings, whatever is necessary. I certainly respect and admire this branch of the government here. Uh, we are making great uh, progress on executing on the mayor's transformation plan. Uh, we set ambitious targets for revenue growth, and we are solidly on the path to achieve our goals. A few have taken us a little bit longer to get going um, than we had hoped. But still, we're going to finish off the year with $712 million in revenue generating initiatives, which is only off by 0.5 percent of our budget. And we fully expect um, to be bringing in a great deal more revenue going forward. On the uh, expense side, um, we are uh, very close as well to our target um, and the difference between uh, our actual expenses and what we targeted had to do primarily with hiring 340 nurses, um, which was something that when I came here, I discovered that we were seriously under appropriate staffing at our hospitals and that uh, we needed in order to make that good to hire 340 additional nurses. Uh, we, we expect to close the year with a cash balance of $781 million, and we project positive cash balances throughout the length of the plan. Uh, as Chairperson R Rivera said, though there are significant risks, and the biggest one uh, facing us is the federal disproportionate share hospital cut it. Uh, this uh, city council has been very active and helpful at uh, expressing to our federal leaders why this cut would be so devastating uh, for us. Um, the mayor, uh, as well as the city council, Senator Schumer, Senator Pelosi, Representative Engel, and the entire New York delegation uh, in Washington are working to prevent this cut. Uh, if the cuts are delayed, the revenue and cash balances in our plan will be significantly higher, and the personnel reductions that are in the out years that would be devastating for our organization uh, will not be necessary. Um, we recognize that there are other uh, risks as well. Uh, we continue to hear about threats to the ACA, um, rhetoric, uh, negative rhetoric about immig immigrants, which is so sad to us in New York City, a, a city um, that was built by immigrants. We worry how that affects their coming for care, um, and we want to make sure that they know that we are always here for them, no matter what the federal rhetoric is. Uh, we were at Lincoln Hospital uh, on Tuesday with the mayor announcing the launch on August 1 of NYC Care uh, in the Bronx. Uh, 
Bronx residents will be able to use their New York City care card to access their own primary care doctor or nurse practitioner, preventive screening and tests, 24 hours, seven day a week customer service, and clear copays um, that are affordable to each member. We're building new ambulatory care locations in the Queens, the Bronx, and Brooklyn, successfully rolling out a single electronic health record and financial system uh, to all of our hospitals and community centers. We're investing in our frontline providers and staff to make our system and the patient experience as great at, uh, uh, throughout our city. Uh, on, on a personal note, I was able to move my uh, 96 and a half year old father and 91 and a half year old mother from Rockland County, where they were in an isolated place, to a few blocks away from here um, so that I could take care of them, but also so that they could get care at health and hospitals. And they, they have the kind of Medicare and supplementary insurance that would allow them to go to any facility, but I know that the best care they will get is through health and hospitals, and I'm proud that they get their care as, as I do, and my daughter will when she arrives in July. Uh, I, I thank the committee for your tremendous support of health and hospitals, and I look forward to taking your uh, direction and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Katz, and I can relate to your story about your parents being here and getting care in health and hospitals. Um, Elmhurst Hospital saved my mother's life three times, so we are very, very grateful uh, for the work that health and hospitals does, and uh, it's life-saving work. It's amazing oftentimes when I go into the Elmhurst uh, operate, um, emergency room and uh, see all the traffic and the people that are there that um, you're able to take care of each and every patient. So. Uh, we deeply appreciate that work. Now, that being said, I do have to talk to you a little bit about this budget reporting stuff that's going on. So as I mentioned in my opening, it's unacceptable that you only provided us with budget information less than two days before the hearing. But even worse than that, after making us wait to get anything, what you provided us is wholly unacceptable and lacking in any sort of useful detail. Your entire $8.4 billion budget was provided to us on a single page. Do you think that providing that bare bones document is useful to the council in terms of having oversight over the funding that we give you? Uh, again, I, I'm sorry, it's not my uh, intention to provide inadequate information, and I certainly respect the, the council's uh, fiscal responsibility to make sure every city dollar is, is well spent. I'm happy to do beyond this hearings to provide whatever information you need, whatever information people want in a, a direct briefing. What is the, the constant delay? Uh, I'm still new at New York City. I, you know, I'm pr proud of the years that I've spent working in healthcare, but I'm still learning our system. And as I understand it, the timing of how OMB, the time of the year that they do the H and H budget, does not comport well with the timing of these hearings. And so, they would normally get it done later on beyond these hearings. Uh, beyond that, I don't fully. I'm still learning how the process here works. So I'm glad to hear that you will commit to um, giving us additional information. Um, what we'd like to see is a comprehensive, bu comprehensive budget report with each financial plan that shows detailed headcount, spending, and revenue information, and what explains plan-to-plan um, -plan changes in your budget. Understood. So um, let's schedule that meeting, and then we can discuss it further. Great. Okay. Thank you. New York City Care. The main goal of New York City Care is to reduce emergency department use and increase outpatient preventative uh, care. Do you have an itemized spending plan for New York City Care? Uh, it is very much a, a work in progress. What I can tell you is that my goal is always to spend the money on patient care, not administration. So we've set that 80 percent of the, d the dollars will be spent on doctors, nurses, and support staff in the clinics itself. 20 percent will be spent on what one might broadly think of administ as administration, but some of that 20 percent, for example, is the 24-hour, seven-day-a-week real person helpline, which arguably is a form of patient care. It's just that not a doctor or nurse. We've, we are in the process of hiring seven primary care physicians who will work in the Bronx 
um, and be able, therefore, to expand their care. On average, a primary care physician would see about 1,600 patients, so that gives us an ability to see about 10,000 patients in the initial time. Uh, we will ramp up as necessary, and we hope that as we provide more primary care, which has been the big hole in the system, we'll see decreases in emergency room use and hospital use for things that really should be cared for in the outpatient area. Uh, recently, I met with the New York State Nurses Association. They have major concerns that even with the implementation of New York City care, as well intended as it is, it's going to impact uh, their ratio of uh, nurses to patients, doctors to patients as well, and that you're going to just be transferring people from emergency rooms to the, um, to, to the uh, New York City care. Um, how do you respond to that? I fully intend to hire more nurses. We've hired 340 in this year, um, and that wasn't- How many left, doctor? Well, uh, I, I have to find out, but that's a net number. So after filling every nurse, because of course people retire, we, we netted 340 more nurses. Um, so we're very much, I think, in sync with NISNA. I fully agree with them that unless there's sufficient nurse staffing, hospitals are unsafe. Um, and that more nursing leads to, to better outcomes. Uh, I do think that the, that the potential for reducing emergency department use and hospitalization is real because, frankly, historically, if you called H&H &H and said you were sick, you were told to go to the emergency room. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's real. And so by now directing people, uh, we know when we've created express care at Elmhurst, um, we've almost out already outgrown our space. Um, and yet now people, instead of waiting hours and hours, are waiting minutes and getting care quickly in what is much more an outpatient setting. So I, I think we, what we're committed to in working with NISNA uh, is the staffing has to be safe. It has to provide high quality care. Whatever the growths are, we'll do our census and we will do the appropriate number of nurses, and it will be based on patient care, not dollars. It will be based on how many nurses are needed, not how many dollars we have for nurses. So when people come into New York City care, I mean, come into, let's say, an emergency room, and they're eligible for New York City care, will you send them over to New York City care? How will that work physically? Right, so the, the goal would be to, in, I, I'll take one step back. Obviously, when somebody comes into an emergency room with substernal chest pain, right, you shouldn't be doing anything other than getting them care. And I'm highly critical of hospitals that are, you know, asking for insurance cards while people are bleeding on the floor. And I've seen this a hundred times. So, you know, I mean, in an emergency room, right, what you want to focus on is what does the person need. But in the discharge from the emergency room, um, that's where we want to say, you know, there is another path um, part of why I think express care is working so well is that it, it's a hard sell if you've always gone to an emergency room to suddenly convince someone to go to a different physical structure. Just like you, people love Elmhurst, right? They know somebody who was saved at Elmhurst, right? So their allegiance is to Elmhurst, and to get them to go to a different clinic may not be so easy. To, to teach them, oh, but at Elmhurst we have express care where you don't have to wait, right? Not so difficult, and that's why we've already outgrown our space in less than a year. So I think, you know, I'm very interested in how do you make transitions easy. People don't change health behavior overnight. They don't start going to a primary care doctor because you said, you know, here's the phone number. You have to help people to make that transition. And will you be doing advertising for New York City Care? We will. I mean, again, my focus is always I want to spend my money on clinical care, right? I, and I want to always exceed expectations. So I never want to be in a position where I'm advertising something that I don't yet have good. So that's why we're rolling it out borough by borough, area by area. I want to make sure that everybody has a positive experience um, it, because otherwise we'll lose them and we'll lose faith in the program. And so yesterday the mayor was on television with the New York City Care card. How much will it cost to produce those cards and to get people set up? Um, do you know the, the cost of the card? 
Yeah, we, we don't, we're still working through that um, as part of the- You should introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm John Olberg. Um, CFO. Afternoon. Yeah, I'm CFO. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, these are the, we're still working through this as we, you know, get ready to go live, you know, this summer. So, you know, the card production, making sure that we have the cards available, um, you know, at the point of, of service and when we de determine that the person's actually eligible for NYC care. So those things we're working through now. Uh, you know, I'm the author of ID NYC, and I was wondering if any thought was given to um, including ID NYC as a New York City care card. So we, uh, it's a very thoughtful question, and we went back and forth on the advantages, the disadvantages. Should it, should it all be one card? Should you be allowed? Should it be an insert into that card? And I think where we landed was that the fastest way was the separate card to start, but look into the possibility. It has to do with the, uh, that you're more expert in, that the ID card has some special features mm -hmm. that would make the adding in not so easy. Mm -hmm. But I, I think going forward, it has a lot of pluses. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the issues is the um, addition of a chip into those cards, and that's been contested by some of the immigrant groups as well. So, all right, we, I think we should discuss that further. Um, and Dr. Katz, I know when you worked in California, uh, you were supportive of a program that distributed surveys allowing patients at, hospital syst at the hospital system there to self-identify as uh, their, their gender identity or their sexuality. What is the current process, process at H&H &H for allowing people to do this? Is there a questionnaire that you use that you can clarify whether any existing um, questionnaires are used? Um, I'm very interested in this because I do believe that it's important for doctors to know their patient's sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, I certainly agree with you, and I'll say most broadly since you began with California, that although people think of California as a progressive place, having nothing to do with me, but maybe perhaps your work and your, your colleagues' work, New York is ahead. I mean, when I came, I mean, there were some things I could look at and say New York is behind, but on, on this issue, New York was ahead. I mean, Health and Hospitals has several pride clinics my Los Angeles system did not. Um, New York City has at Metropolitan the only public hospital uh, gender um, uh, clinic for people who need surgical solutions um, to enable them uh, to, to really fully be themselves. Um, and so I think New York, because of your work and your colleagues, is ahead. Yes, in the new system that we're using throughout EPIC, there is a uh, a system of identification that we've worked with the advocates about to make sure that all of the language is correct and that both recognizes sexual preference and people who have non-binary genders. And how is that uh, asked for? Is it done on, like I went to um, Northwell and it was done on a, on a separate sheet and then handed to the woman rather than asked for because I think people would tend not to want to say sure. it. So a lot of people might not want to say it in front of somebody who's standing behind them online. Right, and we we agree with that, right, that, that the right way, uh, so as it stands now, it's done in the exam room um, between the provider and the person. Okay. Now, it's not done at registration. Uh, one of the uh, testimonies we heard during the preliminary budget hearing expressed concern about intake forms and their inaccessibility for transgender uh, non-conforming population. Um, are you, are you going to look at that form more carefully? Is there um, any study of that form now that going you, on? You've said that I will, I will go back immediately to the office and find out what the issue is and okay. address it with you. I know that there have been some issues with it at Elmhurst Hospital, um, and we've dealt with them individually there, but um, that has been an issue on occasion. The use of pronouns uh, also has been uh, an issue. So. Understood. Um, I complimented you already on the Elmhurst Urgent Care, so I'm going to skip that. Um, I just want to ask about Elmhurst. I'll take the chair's privilege on this one to ask a personal interest in Elmhurst Hospital, um, but I know that there are plans to um, build the, uh, create or build out the emergency room. Has that money been freed up, and um, are we ready to do a groundbreaking by the end of the month? So yes, the money has been freed up. Groundbreaking by the end of the month. I'm not, I, there were some delays in, in the design phase of Elmhurst. We decided that we, it needed to be a little bit larger. Um, so we've d doubled the, the, the capacity there. Um, 
is also as well as with the CPAP, right? We wanted to, you know, replace the CPAP, which uh, treats emergency uh, mental health situations. So there could have been a, a, a delay there, but we can. I will, get I will get back to you on the date, and we look forward uh, to your being there. And I like the idea of city council members having, taking the personal privilege to ask about hospitals they love. Uh, well, thank you. And I thank know you. several of you love particular hospitals, and I think that's fantastic. I think every council member who Should has love a, a hospital. hospitals uh, adopts them. So wonderful, because we know how valuable they are. Uh, last, let me ask you about closing Rikers. Um, we understand that H and H may create or expand units to house uh, de Department of Correction detainees as part of the project to close Rikers. What options are you considering, and what are the budget impl implications of each option? Uh, so uh, certainly, I believe that providing therapeutic units. Um, is the right thing to do. It's the humane thing to do. Um, it would provide people with better, a higher level of care, and I think would ultimately enable rehabilitation to happen more quickly. Um, in terms of the city's process, I'm going to uh, turn to Dr. Yang to explain. I understand an RFP has been led uh, uh, on that. Hi, I'm Patsy Yang, um, Correctional Health. Um, we did retain a consultant after a solicitation um, to examine the feasibility in terms of cost, fit, access, location. But as, as Dr. Katz mentioned, um, we are looking at placing these therapeutic units, which exist in the jails right now, um, placing some of them within health and hospital spaces so that access to the specialty care that somebody might need on a regular basis is more available. Um, requires less transportation and escort by DOC um, and, and improves access to care and reentry because the patients become familiar with the providers in the hospitals and the hospitals become familiar with the, with the patients while they're still incarcerated. It's estimated that about 40 to 50 percent of those who are on Rikers are dealing with mental health issues. Is there any plan for H&H &H to build or to, to deal with um, some supportive housing for those folks? Well, I, I, I'm a huge supporter of supportive housing. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll take a, a slight detour and say, because I thought it's so interesting. Uh, yesterday, uh, when I was seeing patients in my primary care practice, I was about 30 minutes into a visit uh, when my patient just mentioned the time that he had spent in jail and prison. And part of what I thought was interesting about it is I'm always telling people, it's the same people, right? Um, Right, someone, right, whether they're, whether they're in jail now, whether they're in prison now, right, or out, that's just a time frame issue, right? And uh, our goal should always be to take care of people in the best setting possible. And I was glad he, that he felt comfortable enough to tell me that. It wasn't particularly relevant to his, to his medical care, but I think shows that we always want one standard of care, right? The best way to provide correctional health is to provide health care. Right. It doesn't, the fact that somebody is in a jail setting should be, make no difference to the doctors, to the nurses, uh, to the other people. Um, I would like to see uh, more supportive housing in general, and I think that the best way health and hospitals can do it is through land. Uh, we had uh, an opening of com communal life at Woodhall, um, and they were at a, what was once a parking lot. What a great thing, turn a parking lot into supportive housing. Um, and they're interested in a second project, and they were showing me the land, um, and they said, well, we can fit you know, uh, this many units. I'm like, well, why don't you use more of the parking lot? And they're like, well, but you need parking. I'm like, that's fine, we'll build a parking structure. Right? Land is too valuable. This shouldn't be in New York City's surface parking. Right? We'll build a three-level open-air parking lot you know, build, show me what it would be like to build more housing. I think there are a lot of people who, if placed in supportive housing, would be able to stay out of jail. And so happy to work with you and the council on, on how we do more of those supportive housing projects. Okay, thank you, doctor. And I'm going to turn it over now to Chair Rivera. Hi there. <clears throat> So I guess we can start with NYC CARE. So you mentioned the hotline um, as being uh, something that's going to be integral in, in, in NYC CARE. It's 24 hour, it's customer service. I imagine the language access is going to be very much like what you provide now at your H&H &H facilities. And I also 
imagine that there have been some lessons learned from Thrive NYC and the hotline that was offered in that program. What's the anticipated cost of setting up the hotline? Do you have a hotline estimate cost? No, not, not yet. We do not. But this is, again, part of our planning of, of the budget. So we don't have the, the uh, what I do want to be clear is that my goal is sure. that it's very much a problem solving hotline. It is not an information hotline. It's not, I don't, w there are enough ways to find out how to get to a clinic or what clinics are available. What I'm really interested in is receiving the call of the person who says it's nine o'clock at night, I just got a prescription from the emergency room and I don't have any way of paying for this prescription and the pharmacy is closed, where do I go? And being able, because pharmacy, expansion of pharmacy hours, I mean, you know this from Gouverneur, Gouverneur has a wonderful pharmacy, but then what if it's closed and you need a medicine, right? I mean, there, there are ways, and we, we did this in Los Angeles, of making available other pharmacies so that people can get medicines at any hour when, when it's needed. So that, that, that's what we're going for. We will tie it in. There's an obligation regardless for any good primary care practice should have a number to call, right? Well, again, same idea. What if you, what if you got your medicine uh, on Friday afternoon, but in the evening you're not sure how to take it? or you, you had an effect and you're not sure whether it's due to the medicine or not. So I see the expansion of this line as part of what good care should look like. Uh, but as soon as we staff it out, uh, I will just to tie it to another question. We, the site of it is going to be, um, we're pretty sure, an empty ward at one of our hospitals. Because uh, we've talked before about the idea of reusing hospital space. Do you so know which I'm, one? We think it's going to be at NCB. Uh, NCB has a floor that's currently not being used at all, uh, and so we're currently fitting it out for whether or not there's enough room for the, the number of call takers, but consistent with the idea don't leave space uh, empty while you're spending money renting space. Use space that we already have available. That's great. No, I, and I know that um, we've talked about utilization of, of space and how that could potentially, um, I think, be a, a pretty important solution in terms of some of the financial constraints that we're having and how healthcare has changed. So to NYC Care, are you gonna roll out the service line um, per borough, the way that you're doing, the way that you made the announcement in the Bronx? Yes, the, uh, the first we wanna be sure this is a new program that we get it right and that if we don't get it right that we are on a scale that we can make it right at the next go live if you will so that's why we wanted to do borough by borough we wanted a geographic area where i could make sure because part of the commitment here is that when you call you're going to get a primary care appointment within two weeks it's no good to roll out the program and then you call for primary care and they tell you in six months we can get you in, right? That, from my point of view, then it's a failure. Then we haven't done what we've said we're gonna do. So I need to be able to hire the, enough physicians and nurse practitioners and registered nurses so that I can be sure that when it, roll, it opens, people get the, the primary care within two weeks so they don't need to go to the emergency department. So we're three months from launch, right, more or less. And my uh, co-chair, the chair of finance, asked a couple, I think a couple questions about NYC care. Do you have a detailed rollout? And if you do, when will it be available for us to look at budget lines? Will there be budget lines for specific areas? We've talked a lot about the sure. information and communication and we wanna be helpful, so. I appreciate that. So yes, as, as we, um, I mean, as we make decisions uh, for the operation, we're happy to share them. For example, I, mean, I, I already know starting by August 1, seven primary care doctors, and I know what their salaries are, and I know that, and that equals a line item. Uh, so uh, as, as we're putting together the staffing plan, um, I'll, I'll have specific dollar amounts. And you had a visual of, of the card itself, and where it said copays and fees, they didn't have a number yet. So how are you gonna figure out some of the fees and copays that are gonna be associated with NYC Care? Right, so the fees and copays will fit our already existing sliding scales, which are quite generous. And the reason why it doesn't, uh, 
the, it's blank on the example is unlike an insurance card that say you and I have as city employees, we're all paying the same copay. We don't intend that, right? Some people who are going to be in the program, their copay will be zero because they don't have any income. Other people's copay might be $20. So um, we're going to follow the sliding scale, the same sliding scale that we use. But again, I think part of the, the advantage of the card is I always think about new immigrants coming. How would anybody know that these services were available? How would they know that, that if they go, they won't get a bill? And what the card will be tangible proof. Okay, if this is, this is what you will pay, and you will pay no more than that. So it's not, it's not necessarily different co-pays, but it's very different in terms of transparency. When you mentioned the space, well, in terms of the advertising program, I think that's something that's going to be um, really important. We know we have a, a lot of concerns in, in terms of rollout. We want to be helpful. Um, when we had a hearing specifically on Thrive, I, I think if the council had been more involved, we could have had a better, better outcome. I just feel like you know we are on the ground and we know exactly what our communities need. So when you mentioned the call center, for NYC Care and going into a space that's underutilized. Very smart, sounds very, very efficient. You've mentioned this before, you did it in California, so we have high hopes. Where is H&H &H in the process of using space more efficiently? Well, you, you heard another potential example in Dr. Yang's testimony. So the possibility of, of putting therapeutic units at our hospitals um, so that people who are currently incarcerated would be able to get care, and it's not only a good use of the physical facilities, but it decreases uh, deputy time in transporting people. It increases, it will increase the show rates because people will be right there where we have specialty care. It will mean people not, uh, inmates not waiting for hours because of transportation time. So I think, I think that's another major one. Uh, as I mentioned to you at the preliminary hearing, um, some of the state rules on reuse of buildings are a little tougher here than California. Um, and uh, in that sense, I have found it harder, you know, I had a, a hopes of fairly quickly creating therapeutic units and they're all likely to work and no one has said no. Um, but the number of, of steps to do that is a little longer here in New York than in California. I think that that was always our, our concern for you, is the bureaucracy was going to hold you back. But I realize procurement also is in desperate need of reform. So when we're looking at, you mentioned the state, and there are so many uh, state restrictions, and, and the federal climate is certainly no comfort when we're talking about health care and helping the poor and our immigrant communities and people that are underinsured and undocumented. And H&H &H is at the risk of $870 million in loss from decreasing federal district funding, and you mentioned that in your testimony. How do you plan to make up for this extreme loss of income? I know they were delayed. 2018 right. it was delayed. We were all very thankful. Right. But that, that is uh, some serious cash. So what is the worst case scenario? Have you, have you prepared a doomsday plan? Well, the, the budget that you have does assume that that cut happens, but then it balances by having a large number of layoffs, 1,600? Yeah. That, so there are 1,600 layoffs that are attached to the loss of that amount of money. And frankly, I don't see how we could run all of our existing facilities with 1,600 fewer people. So, I mean, I think that the, the horrible you know, ness of that cut um, would, there would be a very different H and H. I mean, obviously, it, it's our job to always do the best we can with the available dollars, but I don't see how we could run the existing system with 1,600 fewer people. How would you choose if you had to close a hospital? How would you even go about making that decision? That would have to be with the administration and with the city council but I, I very much hope not to be in that position. As you know, uh, coming 
Uh, I think there were many people who thought that was going to have to be what happened and through um, a lot of revenue generation, which we've been very successful at and where we see more potential, um, but it's just such a large figure, um, the dish cut, that I just don't see how um, we could get it. Uh, certainly, it would require to not to replace that money would be a huge strain on the, the city budget, and you know, you and your colleagues know more about that than I do. Um, you don't think H and H will be bailed out by the city if the funding's cut? Well, again, uh, you know, I'm I'm new to this. It's a very large number, um, and it gets larger over time. I am I am yeah. hopeful that uh, with the council support, the mayor, the the level of Senate and Congress support we have, and the fact that um, the dish cut doesn't only affect public hospitals. So there are also other constituencies who are making it clear that, that we're talking multiple hospital closures in the private sector if that, if that were to happen. So in your testimony, you also, I'm gonna ask you quickly about EPIC, and I know that some of my colleagues have questions, and we have, been joined by Council Member Barron, Levine, Adams, Cumbo, Maisel, and Richards. Great. So uh, you mentioned in your testimony you're successfully rolling out a single electronic health record and financial system. We all know that is epic across all our hospitals and community health centers. And I guess my question is, what, what is the update on the rollout? Is it still on track for fiscal year 2021 completion? Still on track, it's still successful. Uh, the doctors, nurses, receptionists like it. It's working. It's, it's a better way to chart it. I chart my now, because uh, uh, my clinic uh, switched over, I can testify it's a better way. It leads to better patient care. And as my CFO can, can attest, it also is resulting in more revenue capture because uh, in, in order to get a fair payment from insurance, you have to be able to send a bill that includes all of the things that you do. So uh, on Wednesday, a patient of mine needed an EKG, right? In the old system, I doubt very much that EKG would have ever made it to an insurance bill because it's a separate thing. But now under Epic, that EKG, because I've ordered it on Epic, will make it to the insurance bill. And so we're, we're finding that, that our, uh, what we're going to get paid is go, will go up. And uh, something else you, you planned on, on, you mentioned planning on doing is, is hiring nurses. Uh, a net gain of 340 nurses, a plan to hire more. And can you discuss a little bit the strategy to ensure that there are gonna be safe ratios in your new nurse staffing model? Sure, uh, well, the, the, the most important thing, and my staff understand this, and this is why, in fact, we didn't make our uh, expense reduction, is that nurse staffing is not a money issue, it's a patient quality issue. You figure out how many patients you have and you have to have a sufficient number of nurses. If you don't have those nur that number of nurses, from my point of view, you shouldn't be in business. Either you can run a hospital safely or you can't. And there's no honor in running a public hospital unsafely. So, you know, what I, my view is you, you look at the unit, you figure out the census on any unit. Every unit is different. Um, some, it is true some days you have higher acuity patients than other days. You, you may not get it exactly right every single day, but that, that's the basis. Um, the problem we're still having, and it's why you and still get um, reports from constituents that the staffing was not appropriate, we have two issues. One is in some cases we are not able to hire a sufficient number of nurses for in technical areas. ICU, uh, neonatal, um, operative, emergency room. And we hope to work with NISNA in our new contract negotiation to reflect what we think the, the salaries and benefits need to be in order to be um, competitive. And in some cases, our health and hospitals business model may not be very good. So for example, we hire nurses who are just out of uh, training just out of their college. And then we train them for six months. 
because we accept nurses who, ha who don't have experience. Then after a year or two, if we don't have the appropriate incentives, they leave. So meanwhile, we've paid for the training only for a private hospital to benefit from their experience. And we want to work with NISNA. We have a great relationship with NISNA. Uh, we love them. They love us. We, we're committed together to do, it, to do the right thing. These kinds of issues have to be addressed in order for us to have an adequate number of nurses. No, the, the nurses are incredible, and, and NISNA, I know, is, is doing tremendous work organizing and ensuring that we have a safe safe staffing model. Um, just one more question, I guess, before I turn it over to my colleagues, is, is there a specific budget plan to address the serious issue of mor maternal morbidity? Uh, through your help, uh, the city council's help, the mayor's administration, we are increasing uh, care management specifically uh, for uh, women uh, focusing on Brooklyn and the Bronx and Upper Manhattan, um, and those which are the areas where we've where we've seen the the negative maternal outcomes, um, and we think that with that a lot of it could be improved by getting women into care, and that the best way to get women into care is to have care managers who look like them, who come from the same ethnic groups. Um, who can help lead them into appropriate care. So it is an area where we're expanding. I would say um, our, our chief medical officer, Dr. Allen, uh, who's an obstetrician herself, has reviewed our data, and our data exceed the state's data. That is, we have better maternal outcomes than the state of New York as a whole. But there's still more to do. Is, but is there a specific budget for this, this program, this initiative? Yes. Yeah, I think um, we are in the process of kind of looking at and realigning our resources, you know, to this effort, um, and we can, you know, provide you, uh, you know, the, the exact numbers. That so we you don't have a number on you right now. Yeah, I don't have it right now, but yeah. But I know we're hiring. I mean, I've yes. I, I've met I met with Dr. Allen, and she was reviewing with me the specific positions. Yeah. So this is a question of getting you the detail. We're not, we're not waiting, we have the, we have the plan. Yes. We just have to supply the, the dollars going into it. We're gonna turn it over uh, to Chair Drum. Sure, thank, thank you, Dr. Katz. Thank you. thank you, just to follow up on what uh, Chair Rivera was talking about with um, the nurses. They were asking for about $120 million in um, funding to bring staffing up to uh, the level where they feel it needs to be. Do you intend to include that in your um, a request from the council? I haven't seen actually, I haven't actually even seen what it was that you've submitted to the council, so I don't know. Okay, well, so the, the current submission includes the continuation of the 340 um, nurses. Uh, my assumption is that going into negotiations with NISNA, we're going to make some decisions together. Uh, and they understand, right, that the whole point of it is for our system to do well and they are as committed to the success of H&H &H as anyone, to health and hospitals. So, but I don't yet know, I don't have a, there is not a 120 million ask in the budget currently. And doctor, when do those, when do those negotiations start? June, the contract expires June 1. Okay. All right, thank you. Let's go to um, Council Member Levine, followed by Richards. Thank you, Chair Drum, and thank you very much to Chair Rivera for her great leadership on this committee, um, and it's great to see you, uh, Dr. Katz, always. Uh, in, in a very terrible move, the state cut a important public health funding stream called Article 6, which really is critical for um, health services to some of the most vulnerable in the, in the city. Um, I'm wondering whether this has had any impact on the H&H &H system as far as you know. Okay, yeah. that's good to know. Uh, mostly impacting Department of Health, for sure, yeah, and also many, yeah. many, many CBOs working with uh, everything from in the epidemic to viral hepatitis, and, and we're fighting to, to restore those cuts. Um, uh, we share your passion for helping undocumented immigrants access primary care, and of course, you have uh, been a national leader in that. Um, uh, it is essential for the health of, of hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, and also, as you articulated, it's important for the health of the public hospital system. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that, that, that NYC care 
uh, is implemented uh, in the most comprehensive, impactful way possible. And um, I, as, as Chair Rivera mentioned, um, that ideally would include the nonprofit community clinics, aka FQHCs, that are on the ground in immigrant communities with decades of history, with language competency and cultural sensitivity. And the great programs you designed in San Francisco uh, in Los Angeles, of course, included um, those uh, community clinics from the outset. Can you explain the reasoning of why we have not included FQHCs? I, I know that H&H &H has its own network, but right. the broader world of CBO, nonprofit FQHCs. Well, uh, well, first, thanks for the leadership on the Article 6. It may not affect us directly, but it will certainly affect us indirectly. Yes. Right. I mean, it is health is not a separable issue. And when the public health is not well treated, then what you see is more disease and more hospital costs. So thank you for your Absolutely. leadership on that. Um, you know, uh, NYC care is very much a work in progress. Um, and I don't see it as something that is unchangeable or, or static in any way. Um, certainly, uh, we value the FQHCs. I see two immediate ways that, that we want to work with them. One is uh, we've issued an RFP for outreach services um, so that people are brought in by people they you know, feel comfortable with and are led to the, the right um, clinic and, and the right uh, provider. And then I secondarily see that for FQHCs, the they have problems getting specialty care um, because the, the FQHC, as you know well, as an expert in, in, in how the, the primary care funding works, doesn't include things like oncology or urology, right? So then they're faced with a, a, a patient who they want to take care of and no way to get them to see the urologist or the oncologist. And so we, we want to make it, and this was something we did in LA, that the FQHCs had the same access to specialty care that a LA doctor did who worked in the public system, and I want that here. I want through the consult system that a patient of the FQHCs would be seen by a urologist just as if I had referred them. Um, so I, I think there are these areas where we can work, and again, I'm, I'm open to further discussions as the, as the program rolls out. Well, we have a problem with, uh, as, as you're well aware, with the um, a sharing of information between the community clinics and the public hospitals so that when they refer a patient, they know whether they arrived to their specialty appointment, whether there, there was follow-up or right. important information they needed. And I, and I understand you're working on that, but that, um, even independent of the launch of this program, um, we, I think we need to fix that communications problem. Agreed. Um, I, I know I'm over time, so just very, very quickly, um, if, if it's okay with the chair. Um, you, you, you mentioned that outreach, in your mind, uh, shouldn't divert funding from clinical care, and, and I hear you on that, but we need to reach uh, the uninsured in this city before they show up in the emergency room, or maybe even twice, I'm not sure what the trigger is. We need to reach people in communities where they are um, with trusted intermediaries. Um, again, that's community groups on the ground, not necessarily FQHCs, but the kinds of, of nonprofit community groups that um, have relationships and have built a trust with the, with the communities that are uninsured. Um, and some of that may actually be good old-fashioned advertising on the subways. I'm not sure I've thought that far ahead. But the idea is it, it, it takes a lot to roll a program out in New York City. And um, we want to reach people proactively. Prevention is the name of the game. That's really the idea behind primary care. And, and so we, we do encourage you to think about um, that kind of proactive investment um, as the program grows, and, and very quickly, and then, and then I'll let you weigh in if you want, but um, the, the helpline that you've described for problem solving, I haven't um, heard you mention whether there are people who can answer questions like, um, my, my chest is hurting, should I go to my local clinic, or should I come in to, see, to your emergency room, or uh, um, other uh, clinical questions that require someone who's got 
different kind of training from simply uh, administrative uh, types of questions. Sure, so, so first, thanks for those suggestions and direction, and we will follow up on that. Yes, uh, the, the line would, uh, while it won't be answered by nurses and doctors, they will be able to, to refer it uh, in real time, not as a call back later, but, but we keep doctors and nurses on call, so it, it basically it ratchets up, depending if your question is, what pharmacy do I go to, right? You don't need a registered nurse, right? But if it's a triage question, then you need a registered nurse. If it's, uh, is this medication causing me the problem, then you need to talk to the physician. And so we will move it up depending on what the call is. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank Katz. You. Thank you to uh, both of our chairs. Thank you. Councilmember Richards. Thank you, chairs. Uh, just two questions. Uh, last month, uh, we had a hearing uh, with ACS on uh, patients being tested for marijuana. Um, what is your policy on that? Uh, so uh, first, thank you for that hearing, and it has caused us to look closely at all our policies, and we intend you know, to revise them to reflect the direction um, of you and your colleagues in that hearing. Uh, I mean, the, the, the purpose of medical care is to help the person. Right, and so any testing should be based on a medical need to help the person and should be done with their full consent and there shouldn't be any other testing, right? Our, we're medical care providers, right? Our need for testing should only be because it benefits the person and if they have any risk in that because of someone else finding out, then they need to consent uh, to it. So I appreciate that you ran that hearing and I think that the, the direction of, of the City Council is correct and will help us. And do you track uh, the amount of tests that uh, specifically have been run on patients over marijuana? Right. I mean, I think that the challenge that we have is we have the tests but not necessarily the reason. So uh, for good or for bad, for example, it's a very common thing that someone comes to my practice and asks me to do urine testing because they need it for their employer, right? So obviously a completely different scenario than what you're talking about. It hasn't been easy for us because we have the, we have the data on the test done, but, but it doesn't say, you know, was this test done because someone came to Dr. Mitch Katz and said, could you please do this for my employment? versus other things. But what, what came out of, I think, loud and clear, and again, I thank you for your leadership on, on that committee, is we are medical providers. Testing needs to only be done because there is a medical reason that will benefit the person and with their consent. And there is no other reason for testing. Right. And is this information, I'm assuming, does ACS come to you and request this information, or, or how does that work? No, a ACS does not, has okay. not. All right. Um, okay, last question, just on um, healthcare in particular. I want to focus on the Rockaways uh, specifically because we are about to um, go through another rezoning, and population growth is obviously doubling <laughs> um, at this point. Um, I, is Rockaways on your radar? Uh, is there any? Uh, plans to look at an H H and H facility out there, a clinic? Well, Rockaway is always on my radar because I'm telling my daughter it's okay to move to New York City and give up the <laughs> waves of Malibu because you're going to surf in the Rockaways. <laughs> it's great surfing. So it's almost on my daily vocabulary, uh, the Rockaways. But yeah, we're, we're interested in looking at it. Uh, I mean, I think clinic was the right level. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that there would be an opportunity for us there, and you know, it's it is an area, as you say, you know, that we we recognize is growing, and as our health plan Metro Plus grows, and we want to attract more city workers, we need to have clinics that are available where where people live. We will okay. keep working on it with you. Thank you Thank so you. much, Chair. I look forward to a continued dialogue. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair Rivera. Just a, a couple things, and then I know we're going to wrap. Um, the e-consult system that Councilmember Levine mentioned and the FQHCs and CBOs having access, we just wanted to um, ask whether you would be issuing any regular reporting on that or how often would the training be? I don't know if you have that information now. 
I don't, but I'd be happy to work with you on that. Okay, great. And then the other thing is, uh, you mentioned reducing ancillary staff that leaves nurses to take on additional work. And so just making sure that you all are thinking about and, and, and aware of how that impacts the, the nurse the nurse and safe staffing ratios. Oh, very much so. And, and uh, you know, I view it all as staffing. For example, if you don't have enough uh, personal care attendants and therefore the registered nurses or changing linen, bringing people water, things that have to happen, um, then you don't really have enough registered nurses anymore, right? Because they're not, they're not doing registered nurse work, they're changing the, the bedding. So I think any good staffing plan has to look at all of your staffing. And then lastly, uh, directly budget related, I know that you're looking to cut what you feel is excess costs, whether it's the consultants or, or whatever else that kind of uh, really does impact the budget. You know, we've had, we've been reached out to uh, repeatedly about temps, temps in the administrative position, temps that are out, you know, in the hospital. And so I know that you're looking to, to cut fees and I ask that, I know you've been in touch with, with multiple representatives of, of these groups of, of certain positions. And if you could just keep those, that communication open and ongoing because a lot of the people that have been in these hospitals for many years are dedicated in a commitment in a way that no temp could ever be. And so I just wanna make sure that we are uh, highlighting those, those committed H&H uh, &H employees specifically who have been there a long time. Totally agree, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chair Drum. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Katz, for coming in. Thank you to the H&H &H team. We're gonna take a five minute break and then we will resume with the Department for uh, Environmental Protection, e the EP. So we want to ditch a couple of chairs. Well, you want four, though, right, Michael? Well, suppose you pull.
me it's that old record. Why don't you go say hi to John? All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, no problem. Then you're going here, right? Or you want? Yeah. So you you should go there. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, we'll now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Environmental Protection, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Costa Constantinides. We just heard from Health and Hospitals. We'll now hear from Vincent Sapienza, Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I will open the mic to my co-chair, Councilmember Constantinides. Thank you, Chair Drum. I'm, I'm going to make sure my remarks are brief. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. Uh, and I find it un unfortunate that the Committee on Environmental Protection, which has purview over all citywide environmental issues, does not have the opportunity to question uh, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability today during a budget hearing in relation to sustainability and uh, projects, specifically the new implementation of the CMA, which has uh, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, since we're not able to come to that agreement, uh, the committee and the council will take its action to work forward on intro 1399 to eventually have that power. Um, but I look forward to being able to talk about all things environmental and sustainability in the future at these hearings uh, that are so very important. Uh, now on to the DEP budget hearing. Today's committee will address the mayor's fiscal 2020 executive budget for the Department of Environmental Protection. This committee looks forward to hearing more about why the Council's budget response recommendation for derelict boats was not included uh, in the executive budget, but our saving proposals were. Uh, an update on the agency's four-year capital plan and the 10-year capital strategy, and efforts to bolster sustainability and green infrastructure across DE pro DEP projects citywide. Uh, Commissioner Sapienza, I thank you for your service and all the, your team that all that you do and look forward to hearing more from you and your agency. Thank you, Chair Trump. Thank you very much. And Council, will you please swear in the witnesses? Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Okay, please begin. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Constantinidis, Chair Drum, and, and members of the committees on both environmental protection and finance. My name is Vincent Sapienza. I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, joining me at the table today is Deputy Commissioner Michael Deloach, uh, our Chief Financial Officer Joe Murin, and we have members of the senior team in the first row to help answer questions. I'm here to speak on the FY20 Executive Budget for DEP. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work and professionalism of DEP staff. Uh, this week, J.D. Power & Associates announced that, once again, DEP has been ranked number one in the Northeast for customer satisfaction for, for water utilities, uh, and we've also been ranked number six uh, in customer satisfaction nationally, which is the highest rank we've ever received. Uh, we're proud of this achievement and of the high quality service that we provide to our constituents in the city and upstate. Uh, some budget highlights. DEP's vision is to be a world-class water and wastewater utility while building a sustainable future for all New Yorkers. As I discussed during our preliminary budget hearing in March, DEP's budget aligns with our strategic plan, ensuring that we allocate our resources effectively. Our FY20 budget reflects our critical mission to enrich the environment and protect public health. The projected expense budget for the current fiscal year, FY19, is almost $1.13 billion. For FY20, the expense budget is projected to be almost $1.37 billion. More than 41% of the expense budget is dedicated to personal services. Our FY20 executive budget is largely in line with our preliminary budget, but some additional funding has been included. The executive budget also includes new needs that were not in the preliminary plan. Our expense budget has new needs for filtration avoidance determination, or FAD programs, biosolids disposal, and the installation of green infrastructure. Our capital budget has $293 million in new needs for projects such as green infrastructure in Southeast Queens, blue belts, water mains and sewers, and rezoning work in Long Island City. DEP's 10-year capital plan has a budget of $20.11 billion. The majority of this budget is dedicated to state of good repair work or upgrades to our facilities to keep them functioning effectively and efficiently. About one quarter of the capital budget is dedicated to meeting the requirements of various environmental mandates. The construction of sewers and water mains make up the next two largest investments. Uh, all of these efforts ensure that our water, sewer, and wastewater systems will continue to serve the city's needs today and into the future, and we have a pie chart to the side that, that describes that. On savings, 
Uh, DEP is responsible to taxpayers, ratepayers, and all New Yorkers to ensure that we allocate money and resources effectively. We look for ways to improve processes, identify potential problems, and ensure that investments are worthwhile. Our FY20 budget includes several areas of savings without eliminating any programs or hurting services. And these include $2.8 million for the Croton filtration plant maintenance contracts, $2.5 million uh, for glycerol savings from our nitrogen treatment at our water resource recovery facilities, uh, $1.5 million for fleet initiatives, and $1 million uh, for residuals disposal. Our investments to maintain compliance with our filtration avoidance determination around and uh, the upstate watershed ensures that our drinking water supply remains pristine and that we do not need to build a costly filtration system. New York City is just one of five cities that are authorized to provide unfiltered drinking water to its customers. We recently launched, launched a trash it, don't flush it campaign, reminding people to flush only bodily waste and toilet paper down the toilet. DEP spends nearly $19 million each year to clean clogged sewers, respond to sewer backups, dispose of wipes, and repair damaged machinery. It can cost a property owner more than $10,000 to repair household plumbing damaged by grease and wipes. Our Trash It, Don't Flush It campaign aims to protect infrastructure, help New Yorkers avoid these expenses, and keep the city fatberg free. Um, just on budget and strategic plan, DEP's mission is to enrich the environment and protect public health for all New Yorkers by providing high quality drinking water, managing wastewater and stormwater, and reducing air, noise, and hazardous materials pollution. As I discussed at our preliminary budget hearing in March, DEP's budget aligns with our strategic plan called Enriching Our Legacy, which we released last year. Using our strategic plan as a budget roadmap ensures that our budget is holistic and forward-looking, as the Council called for in the preliminary budget response. Uh, in order to provide world-class and sustainable water and wastewater services, we are dedicating more than $1.2 billion to meet mandates related to the Kensco Eastview Connection Tunnel, more than $980 million to reinforce the structural integrity of the Ashokan Reservoir and the Catskill Aqueduct Pressure Tunnels, more than $600 million for dependability projects related to the expansion of City Water Tunnel Number 3, and another $21 million to the Delaware Aqueduct Bypass Tunnel, bringing the project total to more than $1 billion overall. In addition to these capital investments, nearly 13% of our expense budget, $167 million, is dedicated to paying taxes on upstate watershed lands, which helps us to protect our drinking water sources. Uh, in order to control local sources of pollution, we are dedicating more than $2.9 billion to reduce combined sewer overflows, or CSOs, $62 million for chemicals needed for our water supply and wastewater treatment, and about $62 million for about 1,400 tons of biosolids that our plants manage each day. We are continuing our green infrastructure projects throughout the city. To date, we have constructed 4,500 green infrastructure assets, and over 5,000 assets are going into construction in 2019. Just as important, since 2014, we have added nearly 100 green jobs that provide maintenance and operation of green infrastructure. We just released our green infrastructure annual report, which contains details on all aspects of the green infrastructure program. Um, in efforts to mitigate climate change, DEP is act actively working to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as part of the one New York, the plan for a strong and just city, uh, and its goal to reduce emissions by 80% by 2050. Uh, DEP reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by 23% between 2006 and 2018. About 8% of our expense budget, $109 million, is spent on energy. To reduce this use and expense, we are investing in energy efficient equipment and expanding the use of solar photo photovoltaic hydroelectric, wind, geothermal, and other zero emission systems. Uh, our Port Richmond plant on Staten Island has the largest solar panel installation, a 1.3 megawatt system, uh, on any city-owned property. As we mentioned during the March hearings, we continue to increase our productive use of biogas and biosolids. More than half of our digester gas will be beneficially used by the end of this year. Uh, in order to increase public awareness of our operations and improve service to our customers, we are developing more user-friendly ways for customers to access their water use and account information. We continue to look at creative methods to improve our customer service. For example, ratepayers can track water usage and account information with any Amazon Alexa-enabled device. 
Once users enable the New York City DEP skill on the device, they can ask Alexa for their account information. More importantly, we are investing more than $20 million to update our customer information system. The new system will be more user-friendly and improve DEP's internal system. The project is progressing on time and on budget, and we began implementation on April 2nd and expect the system to go live in early 2021. DEP strives to cultivate a diverse and highly qualified workforce to meet future challenges. We have worked with local nonprofits and job placement programs to create career opportunities for uh, historically underrepresented communities. Since 2014, we have held green job recruitment events. The most recent event uh, was an interview pool this past February. We organized this event in partnership with a number of local labor unions, job placement programs, nonprofits, colleges, and other city agencies. As I mentioned in March, we project a green job staffing program to have 163 people on staff by FY20, which is about twice the number that we had in FY17. The program includes about 50 positions for seasonal workers annually, which may lead to full-time opportunities for people who are successful in their roles. DEP maximizes operational efficiencies by using data effectively. DEP examines hundreds of thousands of data points every year, uh, which track air and water quality and can identify possible issues. We use predictive analytics to identify patterns and opportunities for improvement. To that end, we are dedicating $72 million to replace old and inaccurate water meters. Many old water meters undercount water use. These replacements, replacements make collections more equitable and help DEP recover lost revenues. Predictive analytics and other technology can also support our goals for optimizing performance. We are expanding resource recovery at our wastewater resource recovery facilities. Our field teams are increasingly using tablets, uh, improving their productivity and increasing accuracy and safety. We continue to identify opportunities to use innovative technology and improve operations. DEP provides more than a billion gallons of clean drinking water to New Yorkers every day plus an additional 100 million gallons daily to neighboring counties. Our infrastructure is vast. Our drinking water comes from a series of 19 reservoirs and three controlled lakes over a nearly 2,000 square mile watershed in the Catskill Mountains and Hudson Valley. DEP has approximately 7,000 miles of water mains, tunnels, and aqueducts to deliver clean water, and approximately 7,500 miles of sewer lines to take wastewater to one of our 14 wastewater resource recovery facilities. DEP is proud of the quality services we provide to New York City. Uh, the city's drinking water is widely considered among the best in the world. It meets or exceeds every national and state quality standard. Our wastewater treatment and resource recovery efforts have contributed to making the harbor cleaner than it has been in 140 years. In addition, DEP works to improve air quality, reduce noise pollution, and protect people from hazardous substances like asbestos. Our success is a credit to the nearly 6,000 employees, uh, nearly 1,000 of whom work in the watershed. DEP scientists performed more than 650,000 analyses in 2018 throughout the reservoir system and from the nearly 1,000 street-side sampling stations across every neighborhood in the city. Robotic monitoring stations perform another 1.3 million tests. Uh, just a little bit on uh, the water rate, uh, all of our operation and capital water-related expenses are paid for with water and sewer rate payments. The Water Board recently announced proposing a uh, rate increase of 2.31% for the upcoming fiscal year. For the average single-family homeowner in New York City, this would mean an increase of about $22 per year. The proposal keeps the minimum daily charge at $1.27 per day, remaining consistent since fiscal year 14. The proposal extends the Home Water Assistance Program for low-income homeowners and the Multifamily Water Assistance Program for units within multifamily housing properties. The proposed rates would keep New York City's water rate well below the national average for large cities. The Water Board will hold a rate hearing in each borough over the next several weeks and will vote on whether to approve the proposed, proposed rate uh, at the next meeting. If the rates are approved, uh, they would go into effect July 1st. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions that you may have. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I want to start off with a thank you also to Michael DeLoach for working with me to get uh, fire hydrants uh, fixed in my neighborhood, and I'm, I'm most grateful to him for the speedy response on that. Thank you. Um, let me, since you brought up your employees, one of the things I'm not aware of 
is um, do you have a demographic breakdown of your employees by gender and sex and um, by uh, race? We, we, we may not have that today, Mr. Chair, but um, we, we will send it over to you later today. Okay, but you have that information? We, we do have that, yeah, and it's something we closely look at. Okay. Do you have any estimates of, of, of what that looks like? Just, just in general, uh, our, our staff represents uh, the diversity of the city of New York other than gender. We're heavily male-weighted, and a lot of our blue-collar titles uh, are primarily male. And is that true at the administrative level? Uh, on the administrative level, uh, I think we're more gender balanced. Okay. Um, uh, another um, uh, topic, um, the Flushing Combined Sewer and Sanitary Overflow Project. I think it's been delayed a few times. Do you have a timeline now to design and build it? So, so this is the CSO tunnel mm -hmm. for, for, for Flushing, yeah. So, um, it, it, the uh, Flushing Bay and Flushing Creek uh, areas yet combined sewer overflows when there are heavy rainfalls. Several years ago, we built a 40 million gallon storage tank as, as part of a, a, a way to reduce the amount of overflows, and that tank's worked very well to reduce overflows into Flushing Creek, uh, but we're now looking at building an even larger storage tunnel to reduce overflows into Flushing Bay. Uh, I don't have the timeline with me now, but it's something we've been working with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation on moving forward. Um, the project will be in excess of $1 billion. How much? $1 billion to build a tunnel, uh, but it's something we're actively working with the state on. Okay. Um, let me go to um, stormwater fee. It's estimated that 72% of the city service area is impermeable, which means stormwater is not retained on, on site, but it is rather directed to our sewer system, and DEP spends nearly $700 million per year on stormwater-related expenses. Our stormwater expenses are largely paid out of charges levied on the volume of water consumed with no correlation between consumption and the quantity of water, stormwater generated by a property. This raises an equity concern. In response, DEP is in the process of conducting an impervious service area study to map out the impacted areas citywide. Um, so do you know when that report is going to be released? Yeah, so, Mr. Chair, so we, we've, uh, we're hiring a consultant to help us with the study. Um, just as a little bit of background, uh, every property owner pays their water and sewer bill based upon their consumption of water. So if you've got a large box store, and I won't call out any particular ones uh, that has a parking lot, you may only be paying a water and sewer fee based upon the two bathrooms that, that you have. Uh, and meanwhile, when it rains and there's thousands of gallons of runoff uh, from the parking lot into the sewer system, that has to be pumped and treated. Uh, so we want to more equitably uh, be able to uh, have, have those costs spread to uh, the, the, the property owners that uh, need to pay more uh, and potentially reduce costs on, on those who, who have less permeable surfaces. Uh, so that's what the study will do. Um, we're, we're working on that in conjunction with updating our billing system for DEP because right now our, our system couldn't uh, support a, a stormwater fee, but that's being done as well. So after this study is completed, is there a timeline for when you will make a decision to uh, impose a fee? So that's something we, we work with the council and with the water board on uh, and the administration, obviously, to, to look at uh, what that fee might look like and how it might be potentially um, you know, programmed in over time. Do you have any idea of what a reduction uh, might look like or um, how that might work out? We, we, we don't have any estimates at this time, okay. Mr. Chair. Um, within the week, the Banking Commission will recommend to the council the interest rate to be charged to delinquent property tax owners, taxpayers for the coming tax year. Then the council will consider what that recommendation and adopt a rate. State law requires that the late payment interest uh, rate for people who pay their water bills late will be the same as the rate set by the Council for Late Property Tax uh, Taxpayers. The Council is interested in learning more about how the interest rates are applied to DEP. So for fiscal 2019, the late payment rate is, I think, 7%. How much did uh, DEP collect in late payment interest so far this year, and what about in 2018? 
Count, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, we collect about approximately $45 million um, a year. It was probably somewhat less in the previous year because it was at the 6%, so it did go up when it went up to the 7%. Um, we, uh, we would say that we're, we prefer a higher rate, um, but we're open to if it does go down because the one thing that we do look at for the interest rate you know, the, the lower it is, the less incentive it is for those who are late payers to pay. They will go and pay other bills that have, like their credit card, whereas when that happens, we have to factor that into, you know, the rate setting that we're not going to get the accounts receivables, you know, collections that we should be getting on that. So how many properties have delinquent payments, and um, do you know the value of those payments? Um, I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, but I believe our accounts receivable right now range from probably about $700 million to $800 million in, you know, past due accounts. And those would stratify over, you know, anywhere from 30 days late to up to over a year late. You know, and as you know, those year late ones start becoming, you know, eligible for the lien sale process. Do you know how many are in the uh, delinquent payment program? Uh, not off the top of my head right now. All right, so we'll get, uh, we we'll can get, get that back information to you on that. for you, exactly. Um, based on your water bill collections, would you recommend changing the current 7% interest rate? I think probably not from what you just said. Correct. We would say that we prefer to keep it at the 7%. Okay. Lead service line uh, replacement grant. Uh, lead can enter drinking water when plumbing material that contains lead corrodes, especially when water has high acidity or low mineral content. I understand the fiscal 2020 budget includes a state grant for lead service line replacement of $5.2 million. With this grant, approximately how many homeowners are you able to assist in replacing lead service lines? Yes, yeah, so Mr. Chair, you're correct. Uh, we, we got a $5 million grant uh, from the state to do service line replacements. And just as a little bit of a background, uh, water is delivered to, to properties through city water mains that are lead free, but um, properties and these are primarily residential properties, one and two family homes built in the 19 teens, 20s and 30s when lead was a popular plumbing metal, uh, can still have lead service lines. So um, we've, we've looked at a pool of potential properties, um, and these are, are low-income uh, homeowners, and, and using that $5.3 million uh, to replace their lead service lines. We're, we're guessing it's probably somewhere in the order of about 350 homes can, uh, can be serviced, uh, have, their, have their lines replaced with that, that $5 million. And are you looking to assist them in uh, replacing the, the, the service lines? So, so the way it would be done is DEP would let a contract or contracts to, to plumbing companies, and the plumbing companies would do the work and then be compensated through the, the grant. Um, do you know how many miles or what percentage of pipes are lead? Um, we, we don't. What, what, I, I don't have that mileage or length figure, um, but we recently uh, published on, on the city's uh, Lead Free NYC uh, website uh, uh, an interactive map of, of the properties that potentially do have lead service lines, so that's available. And what about city pipes that are lead? Yeah, so, so all of the, the cities, the, the DEP managed water mains are lead free. Um, we have over the, the, the years found that uh, some city owned properties uh, had lead service lines, but we've worked with all our sister agencies to eliminate those uh, at this point. Okay. <clears throat> I personally like your tr uh, Trash It, Don't Flush It campaign. Um, so DEP recently launched it. Uh, all around the city, this campaign reminds people that certain things should not be flushed down the toilet, such as baby wipes. Cooking oil must also be thrown away and not poured down the sink. According to a recent uh, estimate, DEP spends $19 million each year to clean clogged sewers, respond to sewer backups, and dispose of wipes. With the launch of the campaign, have you seen a reduction in tonnage of material collected from the system at the wastewater treatment plants? Uh, I think I'm going to let Deputy Commissioner Deloach just give a little bit of an overview, and then uh, if Deputy Commissioner Alarda could come up, she can just talk about monitoring uh, quantities. Sure. I think he was asking specifically about the reduction at the facility, so why don't you start, Pam, and then I can talk about the campaign. Sure. Um, the, uh, the, the campaign has been uh, fantastic. I'm glad that you brought it up. The agency and all agencies, all, 
all people, all agencies in our industry, all utilities have been facing this problem for years. And, I, and we've started talking about it a lot over the last year and kicked off the campaign this year. So we, we measure every, we weigh every single container that comes out of our, 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 each of our wastewater resource recovery facilities, the tonnage of the screens, and do that every load every day. So I do have daily figures. And if you look over the last uh, 10 years, uh, starting around 2008, uh, it took a huge jump, just about double in tonnage. And the slope of that line is actually parallel to the wipes sales in the uh, industry. We actually got that data, and we have an interesting graph that shows that. And since, and since then, we've probably, we've, we were at this uh, very high level at this point, and since the campaign started, I think it's too soon to tell. There's, a, there's still some variability a lot of uh, high and low days kind of scattered around. I think over time we'll be able to tell if it's been actually effective in reducing the amount of wipes coming into our screens and our pumps and plugging our system and causing havoc. I'm very hopeful because random people on the street, even if they don't know what I do for a job, talk about it. And um, I think that's been the experience of a lot of people in this room that, they've, that it's become more of a, an awareness. So I think the campaign overall has been very successful. Have you done the campaign in, in languages other than English? Uh, right now we have it in English and Spanish. Okay, it would be great because I have a large Asian community. We get it in Chinese and other uh, languages as well. Absolutely, we're trying to get um, the, the do not flush posters into um, bathrooms across the city, and so we're gonna do those in 12 or 13 different languages. Yeah. But yes, in future iterations of the campaign, we can expand to different languages. Yeah, it's amazing what people throw down the toilet, I have to tell you. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, let me ask you just one last question. The timeline for the uh, billing system, uh, what phase are they in now, and is the project fully funded? Yes, Mr. Chair, the, uh, the project is fully funded. It's both a combination of capital for the new integrated uh, system, that's a computer system, and then for the related expense costs as well. So that's gonna be over this fiscal year, probably moving into fiscal year 21. Uh, we expect that we just started, we kicked off at the beginning of April with the, the contractor. Um, they have begun to do you know, uh, assessment of the business processes, which is going on now, and then they'll start doing the development of what the program will look like. It's an off-the-shelf program, so we expect that to be, that modularity to be able to work for us, so we won't be dependent on consulting contracts as we are with the existing system. We expect this system to be fully functional by the beginning of calendar year 2021. Um, hopefully maybe sooner, but that's what we're targeting right now. Okay, and uh, it'll be online when? Uh, well, it, I'm sorry, it will be online at that time. At we that expect time. it to roll out at the, for, let's say the first quarter of uh, calendar year 2021. Can you give us a sneak preview of um, what features and functioning? You we're, to we're looking to, you know, where we think that we're benefiting because a lot of other systems have gone through such integration already. So there's been a lot of lessons learned that people have had problems and very large problems in implementing such a system. So we're, and this is a vendor that has done this not just here in uh, North America, but is also very, uh, they're, uh, you know, predominant in Europe as well. So they have a lot of experience with this and using what's a Microsoft-based project uh, program for this. And we expect it to offer a lot more billing features for customers, uh, be able to manage and control their, uh, their usage. We, be able to, we expect to be able to be, you know, as uh, the commissioner spoke to for the rate study, we expect to be able to go to more interactive and iterative process of looking at how we can establish things to better manage conservation, having, you know, maybe peak off peak type rate, uh, you know, uh, uh, models, so we expect it to be much more comprehensive than the, the dated system we have right now. And I would just add much easier to use and the clarity in the billing system and the accessibility with technology, on paying online, et cetera, will be much easier too. Do you know if we'll be able to integrate with the DOF's uh, tax, tax system? Um, I don't believe so, and you know, I don't think that there really is a, a need for that, you know, because we two such different things in a way. But, you know, we work very closely with DOF, particularly like when we come to the lean sales. So we expect that, you know, relationship to continue so that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that because I know they just did roll out their system, but there may be the ability, but we haven't really explored that this at this point yet. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chair, Costa Constantinidis. Thank you, Chair Trum. 
Um, so at the release of the executive budget on the 25th of April, the mayor announced $60 million to retrofit city buildings to make them more energy efficient as part of uh, intro 1253. Uh, are there any DEP buildings that have been impacted by this funding? And if so, how many overall? Yes, yeah, so Mr. Chair, we've been working with DCAS, uh, as have several other agencies, uh, to just determine uh, which buildings are going to be um, identified uh, for, for using part of that $60 million. So uh, and we, we haven't uh, seen any allocation yet, but I do want to point out that, that we've made a lot of progress at DUP already, uh, as, as you know, buttoning up uh, some of our facilities, mm -hmm. making them more energy efficient, mm -hmm. using more of the digester gas. So uh, we've been moving, moving forward with uh, conservation work already. And so once we know where DUP's role is, we'll, we'll have a larger conversation with one another about that? Yes. Look okay. forward to it. Um, I definitely, you know my feelings on uh, Bowery Bay all too well. <laughs> and I think, you know, if we can take that opportunity to use some of those funds to kickstart some of the projects that we talked about, uh, the largest square footage in my district for solar, solar application would be at Bowery Bay. Uh, we've said that in private, I'll say it in public. So I would, if there's dollars there that would make sense as part of the 60 million, I would love to see that be part of that. It's, I think it's something like, what was it 200,000, uh, some, some kind of large number of square footage. I don't want to say it on the record and be wrong. Uh, second, um, derelict boats. Uh, so how we do, I know there's a pro program that's going on now in Jamaica Bay. How is that going? And, you know, why was this not included in this year's executive budget at, 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 after we put it into our budget response? Yes, yeah, so Mr. Chair, the, the, the funding that we uh, had provided previously was part of uh, a, an environmental penalty uh, that we had to pay to, to DEC, and uh, we used the DCAS contract, at, which is now underway, to, to remove derelict boats, and got some numbers. They, they're, they're about 60% of the way through that uh, $786,000 uh, of, of funding that we provided. Removed 52 derelict boats so far from uh, Mill Basin, Shellbank Creek. Floyd Bennett Field and Coney Island Creek, as well as 420 cubic yards of debris. Um, and again, about 40% more to go. Um, you know, funding for, for derelict boat removal really can come from any city agency. I think it's just, you know, an, uh, a, a tax levy uh, that anyone could provide funding through the DCAS contract for. So, uh, you know, again, happy, happy to continue the discussion, but it was just, a, a, you know, not something that uh, we, we believe should be in the DEP budget, but happy to continue that. I mean, you guys kind of have the ball right now. I mean, that, that's why I'd love to create an office of marine disposal that I think would make sense that to, you know, everyone kind of says, it's not me, it's not me. Well, somebody, the buck has to stop somewhere, right? Yeah, I, I agreed. And we'd also like to talk about, you know, chasing after boat owners who, you know, when they're finished uh, with, with using their, their asset, just decide to cut the boat loose and let somebody else pick up the cost. So we should talk about that. As no, well. I mean, I would love to do something where we could have days where, you know, much like we have the, uh, you know, yeah, we can just have a day where people can just come and drop them off and crunch them. And, you know, boats are lots of fun until they're not. <laughs> And then it's just very easy to like go into the middle of the night and scratch off the VIN number and let them float out. But then we're the ones that are stuck. You know, it's, it's dangerous for boaters. It's bad for our waterways. Like there's a myriad of reasons why uh, getting derelict boats out of waterways are good policy. It just it has to be somebody's ball. Like my father always taught me when everybody has the ball, that means nobody has the ball. <laughs> so I want to make sure that somebody gets the ball here. Um, so FAD. Uh, there is an additional 5.3 million in this year's budget for the Upstate FAD program. Some of the funding will be going to the Watershed Agricultural and Forestry Program. Other portions will be going to Catskill Waterford Corporation operating costs. Uh, I know DEP must continuously update its plan as uh, one day the Catskill and Delaware water system may need filtration, which we are always working very hard against. Uh, could you provide more details on how the uh, the money will be spent to assess uh, and update the filtration plans. 
But I'll start and I'm gonna ask Assistant Commissioner Dave Warren to come up uh, as well. So uh, just a little bit of a background. So uh, as you mentioned, um, New York City is, is one of only a handful of municipalities uh, left in the country that's allowed to have an unfiltered water system uh, because of the great work that we do in protecting uh, our reservoir system and our watershed lands. Uh, in December 2017, we entered into a new 10-year filtration avoidance determination uh, with New York State Health and with EPA, but that, that uh, FAD agreement requires us to do a number of things uh, like continued land acquisition, uh, working with, with upstate property owners to replace septic systems, uh, doing farm easements and, and BMPs with farmers, um, and, and a, a few other programs you mentioned. Uh, uh, we're, we're also asked to, to study what it would look like if we had to build a filtration system, uh, probably a $10 billion plus system if, if required. So uh, some of the money uh, in the budget is for that as well. And, and Dave, if you want to add anything. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. So from the earliest filtration avoidance determination that was issued in 1993, the city was required to proceed on a parallel track with our source water protection programs, as well as undertaking a conceptual design for a filtration facility if it turned out that the source water protection programs weren't effective. Um, in 2002, we were given relief from proceeding on that parallel track. So we have a conceptual design at this point that is almost 15 years old, and we felt it was prudent to go back, revisit that conceptual design in the light of new technologies as well as current water quality conditions to make sure that it was um, up to date. The money uh, in the budget this year will be used for bench scale pilot testing of alternate uh, treatment technologies, um, and we'll be using actual uh, water from the reservoir system tested at an offsite location to assess the effectiveness of, of various treatment options. How, how do we evaluate the FAD in real time? Um, how do we know, like, what, what sort of reporting do we have? How do we know where we stand on a year-to-year -year basis? Um, sure, we do um, extensive reporting as required by the FAD. The commissioner made reference in his testimony to the extensive water quality testing program that DEP undertakes both in the watershed as well as in the distribution system here in the city. Um, we provide annual reports to our regulators at the State Department of Health, both on program implementation as well as water quality status. Um, those documents are, are found on our website. Um, and then every five years, we also do a summary and assessment document which looks at the status and water quality trends since we began extensive monitoring in the early 90s. Um, that was most recently completed in March of 2016, and we'll be doing that again in the spring of 2021. All right. And then, okay. I just sort of checking in here also the state mandated dam safety assessments. Mm -hmm. Um, how routine are those inspections and what's the turnaround time on the analysis with the lens towards if we're going to need additional capital dollars and how soon can we get that into the 10-year capital plan, right? I'll, I'll start and then I'll, I'll let Dave take over as well. So um, DEP has a very robust uh, dam safety program. Uh, we, we have Dozens of dams, uh, 23 of them are, con are categorized as, as high hazard dams, so we, we pay particular attention, uh, obviously, to those. Uh, there are regular assessments that are done uh, for, for structural stability, uh, hydrogeologic, seismic, and, um, and then every 10 years, we have to do a, a state-required um, assessment, and then we'll let Dave continue from there. Um, yes, absolutely right. So the the state dam regulations are administered by DEC. They require these 10-year assessments, so we put funding in the budget for a multi-year contract. I think it's a five-year contract that would allow us to um, undertake these assessments, and uh, it's a two-year lead time, so when we um, hire the, um, the contractor, the consultant, to perform the assessment, once we direct them to do an assessment on a particular dam, it takes two years to, to yield that report. It's done in conformance with the state standards, um, and then it's submitted to and reviewed by DEC. All right, so we're, in, we're constantly wor working on this to make sure that these needs are put into the capital plan as, as required, correct? Yeah, absolutely. That's you know, one, one of our, our highest uh, priorities for safety are, are our dams upstate. They're, they're impounding a lot of water, and we want to make sure that they're uh, very stable. 
Okay. And then, so, so speaking about uh, repair and keeping things good repair, let's talk about sewer and water main repair. Um, so the executive plan includes 15.5 million in fiscal 2020 in the out years for sewer and water main work. That is not capitally eligible. The work includes sidewalk restoration around the fire hydrants and catch basins, sewer cleanings, installation and rehabilitation of collapsed catch basins. For fiscal 2020, what is the total budget for sewer and water main emergency repair work citywide? Um, certainly, certainly uh, Mr. Chair. So one of the things, just to give a little background, is that what we've been going through and working with both OMB and the Comptroller's Office is looking at our capital expenses and making sure that all of those are meeting the capital eligibility criteria so that they can be properly bonded. In going through that review, some of these, as some of these charges in looking at the sewer and water system were found that they weren't eligible, so that those had to be moved over to the expense side. At this point, the additional $15 million that was added this year brought the total to $27.9 million in expense. Of that, most of that is for catch basins, hydrants, and um, sewer lining, um, uh, TVing, which is looking at the, t sending the camera down to look at the inspection. The sewer emergencies and the water main emergencies are a very small part, less than $2 million of those annual charges. On an annual basis, we spend about $37 million, which is what's budgeted for fiscal year 24, uh, sewer emergencies, water main and sewer emergencies. And that money, that amount over the 10-year plan comes to $740 million. So the expense component is a very small uh, portion, less than 3% over the 10 years, as a, you know, the overall component of the emergency work we do for the water mains and sewers. All right, and in recent years, have you seen an increase in the amount of uh, emergency reconstruction of any of this work? Um, I would defer to uh, Deputy yeah. Commissioner Georgilis uh, uh, to, uh, to speak to that. Good afternoon. Asa, how are you, sir? Good. Uh, we haven't seen an uptick. It's just the funding uh, switch from the capital to the expense side, but the funding is the same as it's been for the last couple of years. Are uh, we holding the contractors to, you know, the quality of the job, making sure that there's good work? Yeah, we have a robust team of engineers. They go out every day with the contractors, and we hold them up to high standards. We haven't seen any uh, sort of slip or anything from the contractors. And how involved with you on the, I know there's water main projects going on throughout my community. Are you involved with DDC with those projects, or it's just DDC sort of running the, the whole ship there? So we identify and send the projects over to DDC to start the work. Uh, DDC manages the construction of the work. We'll get involved if uh, we have any complaints or any reason to go out. We'll stop out periodically to check up on them. We'll, we're the ones that are out there uh, performing the water main shutoffs. When we do, we actually touch the valves with our crews instead of DDCs. And then when the work is done, we generally, uh, if time allows, we'll do a final walkthrough with them. I mean, I'm just bringing this up because I've had issues with, with pitching of the street and ends up with ponding issues and, and various challenges around these DDC projects. And then it's, you know, DEP and others who have to get stuck dealing with ponding issues. And you guys have to come out and do a lot of that evaluation. So uh, I'm probably going to be sending a case over to you that someone stopped me on the street two days ago about that same chunk type of challenge. So um, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, if you have a ponding issue, send it over to me, because that's something that really upsets me as well. Um, and lastly, ab about the, the executive capital commitment, um, there's $223.3 million for floodwater resiliency at the various DEP sites. Uh, can you please provide some of the particular sites that you're targeting, uh, and then the measures to protect against potential storm rising, uh, sea level rise, as we look into the latter half of this century? Yeah, so, so Mr. Chair, there are uh, 21 facilities. They, they're essentially all wastewater uh, resource recovery facility, uh, treatment plants, and pumping stations. Uh, all of those uh, facilities are located near the shoreline, so they're all susceptible to, to storm surge and, and sea level rise. Uh, and so we're doing a variety of things with the, the $223 million to harden those facilities. Some are raising electrical equipment to get get them out of the, the, the flood zones. Um, some are just making sure that doors are hardened to, to keep water out of, of facilities, um, doing a bunch of things. We're, we're, we're using the guidance from the New York City Climate Resiliency Design uh, Guidelines for, for year 2050. 
which is essentially the FEMA 100-year flood plus 40 inches, um, or the FEMA 500-year level, whichever is greater for that particular asset. So that work is moving forward. And I should also note that after uh, Sandy, we, we did get some FEMA money as well that went towards and continues to go towards uh, hardening of those, those shoreline assets. There we go. I had to push my own button. Anybody, I mean, you know my, you know my concerns around these aging plants and you know, where they're su situated are all in, in, you know, on the water. So we're going to have a lot of challenges as we look from the, the latter part of this century, especially with precipitation increasing. Right? We're expecting more water to go into our sewers than ever before. It's been pretty miserable the last couple of, couple of days here in New York City. It just continues to rain, and it's, it's continuing to rain every single day. But that's because of climate change. We live in climate change. That's going to become the norm, not the exception to the rule. Um, so with all of this happening, we have to recognize that they're going to have continued investment, correct? That, that, that's absolutely right, Mr. Chair. And uh, with, with, with more frequent storms, more intense storms, uh, it, it just is, is more of a challenge uh, for, for DEP. Uh, with sea level rise, it just makes it, makes it tougher hydrologically to get water drained off the street quickly. Uh, so these are all things that we continue to focus on. I know that there's several members of our committee here. It's Kalman Yeager, uh, Council Member uh, Rafael Espinal, and Council Member Manchaca. Uh, Council Member Richards was here, and Council Member Rosenthal was here as well. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back to our chair, Danny Trum. And I know uh, Carlos Manchaca, uh, Council Member Carlos Manchaca has questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Finance Chair. Uh, I welcome. My, my question, and I know I, don't, I only have three minutes, so I'm going to focus a little bit about the work that you're doing on the sewer system citywide. Uh, some of that is coming to Red Hook. We're really excited about that. Can you walk us through that? Also, I kind of want to get a sense about your relationship to DCP and thinking about what kind of is, what is on its way and how you make these decisions in terms of investment to critical infrastructure and we'll keep it at that. So, so I'll start and then we'll, we'll call up the team as needed. But um, when we do planning for water mains and sewers, we look at a bunch of things, just capacity. Do we need to increase size because uh, there are more people living in a certain area? Uh, we look at the condition. Have we been you know, making a lot of repairs on, on certain assets uh, frequently? Um, and, and whether or not there are rezonings as well. That factors in. So as you mentioned, we work with the Department of City Planning if there are rezonings, and they'll give us estimates of what uh, the, the neighborhoods may look like in, in, in 10 or 20 years. Uh, so we put that together. Uh, I'm going to ask Deputy Commissioner Lakata to come up to talk about that, um, how we get feedback from, from DCP. Thank you. And I'll, I'll mention in a, in a quick, as you settle in, um, a place like Red Hook, for example, I almost like flies have to swat away the developers who come with beautiful, well-budgeted um, presentations of towers in, in Red Hook, and every time I go tell them to go away. And, and so, but DCP probably has some of that information, and so there's, for me, there's a discrepancy in, in what like the market pressures are, are offering, what a council member and their community is deciding on what to accept as possible decisions and then there's DCP so I, I guess I'm, I'm really trying to figure out what where where is where's the real real and and uh, I will, I'm only here for another two and a half years I know the council member might come in with with a different perspective and and then where are we then and so how do we how do, how do we reconcile all those different pressure points uh, I'm starting at DCP but really kind of give me a better sense of the whole thing thank you yeah so just really quickly um we have begun to work with city planning even in more earnest. I mean, we've been working with them for um, as long as I've been with the department, which is 30 years. Um, but we are beginning now to really focus and zero in on where the growth is happening and looking at the uh, demographics and the population shifts. Um, there is a lot of pressure. It's a vibrant city, a lot of uh, construction going on simultaneously. And so city planning does a really fantastic job of trying to forecast where that growth will 
occur, but that doesn't always happen um, as anticipated. So it's important to look at those forecasts that city planning does, but also for our department to start to really see and look at the building data. And where are people pulling permits and where are those um, housing starts, if you will, occurring. So that's the type of work that we're going to begin even more systematically um, in the next several months because we actually have a contract that will soon be registering um, for that effort. Okay, thank you. Red, on the Red Hook side for sewers, can anyone answer that question? The, the, the big mega plan for sewers? Yeah. Bring up Deputy Commissioner Judge Ellis. I apologize, I don't have specifics of the sewers in uh, Red Hook, but we can get back to you with the project details. Okay, please do, that'd be great, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Espinal. Thank you, Chair. Uh, quick question, and it's in regards to what's been in the news uh, in the past few days, and that's garbage disposals, on how they've been illegal in New York City until 1997. Um, to my knowledge, uh, the garbage disposal, uh, the, the, the waste that goes through the disposal, disposal, of course, goes in through our, our sewage system, but it becomes uh, bio, bio uh, solids. And the biosolids, uh, from what I've read, either uh, get sent to be composted or they either go to landfill. What is the piece practice uh, and is there an extra cost uh, to the department, to the city, if, if New Yorkers decide to install uh, garbage disposals at home? You know, it's a great question, Council Member, because it's something we've been grappling with for forever in New York City. Um, the, the, the concept is, is that basically you can take organic food waste that you'd otherwise throw in the garbage and it would sit out on your curb and smell and attract rodents and you could just put it down your sink and it would make its way to a wastewater treatment plant. The issue that we have in New York City is that we have primarily a combined sewer system. So newer municipalities have two pipes in the street, one for sanitary sewage, which includes macerated food waste from your grinder, and the other is a storm sewer. But in New York City, we primarily have one sewer in the street um, that takes all of that flow, and during, during moderate to heavy rainfalls, um, there can be uh, an overtaxing of the system and releases of that, that untreated wastewater into local waterways, which would include all of that macerated food waste. So it's always been a concern for us about you know, what's happening. Are, are people using their grinders when it's raining one? Uh, the second concern we just had about getting more food waste into our plants, if it were going straight into the digestion process, that would be great because we'd be making more digester gas, renewable, but going into the beginning, the head of the, the wastewater treatment plants is actually giving us a nitrogen load. We then have to, you know, remove that nitrogen, which is otherwise a, a fertilizer in the receiving water. So we've always had that challenge. It's, it's been a balance. Uh, we, we, in 1997, we did allow them for residential use, and they continue to be allowed for residential use. Uh, but we, we do have a concern about if it were widely spread, uh, both in, in residential and, and if it ever got allowed to be commercially used. So currently, uh, what, what would you say? What, what are the what are the probabilities that the, that the biosolids would actually be used in in a, in a more positive environmental way than ending up in land? No, that's that's something we're definitely pushing forward with. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Lauder has a whole program uh, to do that. Uh, thank you. Another favorite topic of mine is biosolids. So, in addition to the uh, the problems that our commissioner just mentioned, if you imagine the collection system that's got about 7,000 miles of sewers themselves. The particulates of that macerated food doesn't travel very well in there, and a lot of our campaign around uh, flush it, don't trash it has to do with fatberg growth, and they would add to the fatbergs, not just because of the, the volume, but also the grease that comes with people uh, smashing food into the, the system. But onto the biosolids world, um, currently from um, our, our digested uh, system, we make biosolids, and about 12 to 15 percent of that goes to compost facilities for further refinement and ultimately fertilizer. And the rest, um, another percent, uh, we send to another uh, solids processing unit, but the rest is mostly landfilled. About nine, 80 percent or so is landfilled. Uh, we have a lot of drivers for not to not to continue to do that. One, it's a very valuable fertilizer product. It uh, sequesters. Carbon sequestration is a very high uh, performance from biosolids. I came from a utility in the West Coast. We were running our operations at carbon neutral 
because of our biosolids program. Um, landfills is not a sustainable program long term, so we are working on getting back in the business of beneficial reuse of our biosolids products, and it's, it's, a, it's a long haul and some significant uh, work needs to get done. Okay, so for the record, uh, would you advise New Yorkers to buy a composter or to buy a garbage disposal if they want um, to do the right thing by the environment and by our I, waste? Personally, uh, not, we are not in favor, I am not in favor of a garbage disposal. There's a number of reasons that we articulated today and um, we're uh, looking uh, to discourage people from doing that. The best thing to do is to put it in your compost, the brown bins, or take it to the food markets where they take it. Um, and it goes directly to be their compost, or it actually can come to our digesters. Um, Newtown Creek right today is accepting food waste uh, for that purpose. And we're creating more green gas, which is another environmental benefit. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Chair Constantinidis? Oh, no, I just want to make sure I think you got about the gavel closed. Oh. So I just wanted to thank my staff on the, in the EP team, uh, John Seltzer, uh, Samara Swanston, Nadia Johnson, Ricky Chala. Thank you for all that great work. And my team, Nick uh, Wazowski, for helping to put this hearing together. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to DEP for coming in. Uh, we appreciate you giving testimony, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. This meeting is adjourned at uh, 2.50 in the afternoon. <laughs>